Good afternoon, everyone. It's 1231, and we will uh, call to order the March 27, 2024 meeting of the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency Board of Directors. With that, I'd ask everyone to please rise and ask Director Turnley to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, roll call, please. Chair West. Yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mulhart. Here. Director Borchard. Here. Director Tremblay. All right, thank you. Moving on to agenda review. Any proposed changes to the agenda? No changes to the agenda, Chair. Next, next, we'll move then to public comments. Anyone wishing to address the board on matters not otherwise on today's agenda is welcome to come forward and do so now. All right, seeing no movement, hearing no voices, we'll move on to board member comments. Any board member comments before we move to the consent agenda? All right, then the, only a couple of minutes and an, one item on the consent agenda, if um, unless one has a question or a comment, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. And a roll call, please. Chair West. Yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mulhart. Yes. Director Tremblay. Uh, yes, but abstain with respect to the February 28 minutes. Yes, sir. Director Borchert. Yes. All right, thank you. Moving on to item number four, the uh, GSP annual report. Nope, wait a minute. Is that the right one? Did I skip one? Nope, I'm right. For the uh, Las Posas Valley Basin. That's number four. Number four, yes. Number three is included in the consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, Chair West and members of the board. For the record, I'm Dr. Faraika Seke, agency staff, and I'll be presenting on item number four in your agenda packet, uh, the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Annual Report for the Las Posas Valley Basin for Water Year 2023. As a background, um, so the GSP annual report or Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, Sigma requirement, and these are due April 1st following adoption of the GSP. Um, and your board adopted the GSP uh, in December 13, 2019, which is resolution 2019-05. This was together with the OPV basins. Since ad adoption, uh, this is the fifth annual report submitted to DWR um, in this series. And uh, this particular report covers water year 2023, and that is from October 1st, 2022 to September 30, 2023. Uh, this is basically a technical document that is governed how we prepare it by DWR. To date, DWR has acknowledged receipt of the first four submissions and has not requested any additional uh, information. If there's anything wrong with the submission, then uh, DWR uh, gets back to us with that. So for the four that we've submitted so far, everything has been fine. The Los, Los Postas Valley Basin is an adjudicated basin uh, following the uh, the judgment that was paid, uh, that was entered. And so this judgment basically governs the way that we move forward and it provides for comedy consultation process. And this is one of the areas that the com uh, committee consultation process is required. Now, 
staff required the annual report uh, to the policy advisory committee on February 29, 2024. And this was discussed at the uh, March 7, 2024 PAC meeting. And the PAC made their recommendation report, which was dated March 14, 2024, which is item 4A in your pocket. Staff response uh, report is dated March 20, 2024, which is item 4B. So in the recommendation uh, report that the PAC submitted, um, I'll summarize and kind of give um, what staff recommends. And this has been a very, um, I'd say the PAC gave very good input uh, to this document. Uh, so PAC requested a 60 day extension for submission of annual report to DWR. Uh, they cited unique circumstances being that this is the first time that we're submitting an annual report uh, to DWR after the adjudication and that they request the Technical Advisory Committee, the TAC, to review the report. However, staff um, recommends that we continue to adhere to the SIGMA regulations, which uh, basically require that we have to file this by April 1. And this April 1 deadline is built into the SIGMA legislation and the DWR emergency regulations. And so this is a date that we have to submit uh, the report by. There's also no um, process that is elaborated that uh, would show whether DWR has the ability to um, grant the extension. Uh, so that's unclear. And uh, given how we have been able to do this for the past four years, I think it might unnecessarily draw attention to how the basin is being managed, especially under uh, with adjudication just kicking off. Uh, similarly, I would also want to uh, point out that the period covered by this report is for the previous year, which is uh, the water year 2023, defined as October 1st, 2022, to September, uh, to September 30th, 2023, which was before the judgment really kicked in. So for this, um, the water master referred this to the PAC to get some input on it, but this is technically uh, for the year prior to that. Moving forward for future uh, annual reports, the water master will send this document to uh, the PAC and TAC in early January or earlier, uh, just to make sure that there's enough time for feedback uh, for the PAC and TAC to uh, have the input uh, put in. This is specifically for this year that we're looking at this. The second recommendation from the PAC was that the best available science requirement was unmet. And they cited missing data from Cayuga's Mutual Water District and we thank the PAC for pointing this out and we went back and looked at the data and we included the missing data which had been uh, er uh, erroneously omitted and we revised the contour maps in the annual report. Um, these revised maps are similar to the maps that were reviewed by the PAC. Um, and so it really didn't change um, our understanding of the basin or anything else in the report. The PAC's third recommend, um, recommendation um, that they pointed out was that uh, change in aquifer storage analysis was limited to the Fox Canyon and that it omits uh, the Grimes, Epworth, Upper San Pedro, and the shallow alluvial system in the west. Uh, the lack of data or data paucity in the L, in the Los Posos Valley Basin is something that is known and has been acknowledged in the GSP and has also been discussed in detail in earlier reports, uh, specifically the 2020 and 2022 uh, uh, GSP annual report. Um, 
FCGMA, FCGMA has pursued funding, uh, but not received any to plug in these data gaps. And so just to give an example of the aerial extent of the data that we have, for the Grimes and Epworth, they have one well each, which, is, which can be included for analysis. And then for the shallow alluvial aquifer, uh, this is two um, monitoring wells that can be included, but that's not enough. And this is compared to what we have in the Fox, which has 11 wells, and that's why the data reflects this. This is why we are focusing more on the Fox. Um, thirdly, the Upper San Pedro is not defined as a, as a principal aquifer in the GSP, and therefore no action was taken as the requirements in the uh, preparation basically state that this has to be for the principal aquifers. And the last recommendation from the PAC was that the uh, ASR well-filled operations were poorly characterized uh, and missing important context. Uh, staff took this recommendation and went back and revised to provide context to um, the ASR well field. Now, our recommendations are that you, your board approve and authorize staff to submit the water year 2023 annual report for LPV uh, to DWR, and we also just kind of picked up um, a calculation error, which is about 12 feet, and we ask your board that you allow us to make that uh, edit before we submit it, and secondly, to receive and file this staff report. Thank you. Thank you, first night. Questions or comments? Um, as you're talking about the modifications, the amendment to the plan, um, the data points you're going to also include in that? Uh, sorry, I didn't. You said there was missing data points and the, is a draft revised. So the, the amended um, plan that you're asking us to submit today has those data points in them? Uh, no, we just picked that up right now. So the ones that were picked up before were the ones that were revised. But we continuously keep looking at it and trying to look at the templates that DWR gives us. And with the formatting, we picked up that there was an inconsistency that was there. And so it's a tedious process, and we kind of have to do that. And so that's when we picked up that uh, it's a small discrepancy. And we've already identified where that error occurred, where we basically carried, uh, put in the wrong number uh, for one of the items. Okay, so for your, for example, the 12 feet that you were talking about, that'll be in the next plan. So we've captured the data, we fixed it, but it won't be included in the plan that we're submitting for last year. That's the edit that we'd like to make before we submit it. Okay. Yes. Okay, just making sure which data points, yeah. even if they're erroneous, I think it's important to be accurate uh, yes, as the, much as we can. Uh, those ones were already included, and so we revised the, the map for that. So this is uh, an additional dot that we just picked up as we are formatting it for DWR submission. Okay, and then I do agree with the, um, the thought process of not hitting the due dates for DWR would cause more of a red flag than, um, than we would want. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, I do agree on the point of submitting the plan as is making sure that the PAC and the TAC review the plan so that we can make sure that for the next middle, all those points are included in as well. Uh, yes. Because it is a working document, right? Yes, from uh, the next year, mm -hmm. this would be, we envision uh, taking the PAC and TAC much earlier mm -hmm. uh, through the process, but because of the timing uh, that happened this, this year, it was more like, okay, we need to, we basically haven't changed much from what we've been doing before. Let's get this one done, and then uh, we can do it uh, differently, okay. which is something that we uh, communicated to the PAC. And, uh, to the PAC. Okay. I, I just wanted to confirm, because I do appreciate the partnership with the PAC and the TAC. And so as we say, okay, no, but we're submitting it, I want to make sure they know that we are listening, and it is a work in progress. So, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Any other questions or comments from the board before we open it to the public? Uh, my, my comment is, first of all, um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I appreciate the, the staff report on the, the process, and I appreciate the committee going through their process and making the comments. I think that's the way it was designed. I also recognize that this is a learning curve for both entities. This is new business for us. And if I recall, only the last meeting, or very, I think it was the last meeting that we had, or maybe before that, um, where we went through the review of the members that were going to be part of the TAC. So to me, there is a steep learning curve for both entities. And I would agree that it is better to get this report in I don't think it has significant changes from the prior years. And I think the commitment um, of staff that we need to work with the PAC and the TAC um, to make sure that we have a sufficient starting point so we don't run into this problem again. If this problem comes up next year, that's a whole different ball game. But going into this year, I think it's appropriate and I think it's, I, I agree with uh, Director Long that, that it, it probably could cause a lot more problems than we need. It's better to get it in. If there's major adjustments or amendments we have to make, then we can do that if necessary. But the lesson learned is that all the parties need to be involved in this process and give us sufficient time to get this thing analyzed correctly. And that would be, um, any recommendation that I would approve would be subject to making sure that staff and this board specifically say that we need to adjust the start dates and everybody knows that the start date will start sooner so we have time to get this thing done uh, across the T's, dot the I's. But for this year, I'm okay with what I've seen that I don't think it's a material uh, change. I think it's a process change that we're going through and I think we can correct that if necessary going forward. Any other comments? Mia, any questions or comments from the public with respect to item four? Hi there, John Lindquist from United Water Conservation District and we tend to stay out of Las Postas Valley but I wanted to add our own experience unless Someone else here has had experience with these annual reports for adjudicated basins. I'd love to hear from them. But United has been submitting, um, along with the Technical Advisory Committee for Santa Paula Basin, the TAC, these annual reports since 2015, the Sigma required adjudicated basin reports. And we've also been attending the annual um, the webinars that DWR hosts on getting those reports in. And a lot of basins, the adjudicated basins that are submitting these reports, they're submitting for the year prior to the year prior. So they're actually submitting reports. Or like this year, they'd be submitting reports for water year 2022, these adjudicated basin reports. And what DWR has told us, you know, because they have, they have water masters, they have judges, they, there's a lot of process that often has to go through before these reports can actually be submitted. So there's no way to get them done by the beginning of the April of the following year. The point is, DWR staff have told us numerous times they're happy to get whatever they can, whatever we're willing to give them. And so, like I said, a lot of folks are working two years behind. On the other hand, they also don't mind if you submit something that you consider incomplete, just give them a letter or something like that saying, hey, there's some things we want to work on and we're going to resubmit or submit a revised draft later this year. And that's fine for them too. So <clears throat> I guess all I'm trying to say is it almost doesn't matter what you choose here. DWR is going to be happy to get whatever you're willing to send them. It's not quite the same as um, a GSP-governed basin. Um, when they're adjudicated, it's a different, it's a bit different story from our experience. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the public, either here in the boardroom or online? Is there anyone online? No. 
Good afternoon, board members. My name is Daryl Smith. I'm a grower. You probably have seen me at a few meetings here. I unfortunately came in a little late, but I did see that uh, Epworth Gravel and Saga San Pedro is uh, somehow being exempt. Uh, I happen to be in uh, Epworth Gravel, and I wonder how the water master is going to deal with me. Uh, I have... Uh, some questions to ask about the adjudication and that Fox Canyon groundwater management was involved with, uh, as I guess a plaintiff in the, in the matter. And um, as a plaintiff, I feel that I am represented by Fox Canyon groundwater management and that I've stayed in compliance, have paid all my extraction fees, have put the meters on and Somehow or another, I was escaped notification. And as a result, I see that I'm not on Exhibit C in the adjudication. And I was just wondering, it's uh, on all the meetings I attended, not once did I hear from anybody that uh, had I not joined the adjudication or lawsuit, that I was subject to lose my allocations. And I'm wondering, and that I'm in Epworth's Gravel, I'm not. Fox Canyon, does uh, the board as the water master considers me to lose my uh, allocations? And if so, I'd like to know why, other than the court has made that determination. And I see in uh, section 9-4, in the interest of justice, the, the judge has indicated that in the interest of justice, that perhaps uh, he would change his mind. I would like to know how uh, as the water master, the GMA feels about that. Daryl, that's not on the agenda. I that's know that. Not, I, that's I, I, not pertinent to the issue that is on the agenda, and it's not an issue that the board is going to take up at this meeting. Um, I appreciate that you came in a couple of minutes late, and that might have been appropriate for public comment, but even in public comment, that those are not items that the board can engage on. I appreciate the question, um, and I'd be happy to have staff look into it and try to get back to you separately, but that's not an issue we're gonna take up today. Thank I, you. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Any other questions or comments from the public on this item? If not, okay, returning to the board, what's the, um, Preference of the board with respect to item number four. I would motion to approve staff recommendation. The revised report. The revised as amended. Okay. There's a motion and a second. I'll second. We actually, Director Trembley seconded it already. Can hear him because he's, of his voice. He's lost it's his voice. It's all right. The aliens took over my voice. <laughs> We're going to have fun with that all day today. You know, we are. <laughs> in, in all the years that I've known you, and it's been a long time. I've never heard you this quiet, working and, so hard. And some so. of us have paid to make that happen. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This is, this is a, a shocking thing, please. so I That's apologize. A, thank you, Director Mahart. <laughs> okay, roll call. Chair West. Yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mohart. Yes. Director Trembley. Yes. Director Borchard. Yes. All right, thank you. Moving on next to item number five. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm going to recuse myself from this item. My alternate, Shelley Berger, will be acting in my place or acting on Shelley, come join us, please. What's that? Thank you. Right. Okay, let the minutes reflect that um, alternate Director Berger has taken the seat for Director Mulhart. With that, Jason. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair West, members of the board. Um, Jason Kander, Ventura County Council's office, representing or acting as agency counsel at, the, at this moment. Uh, this particular item is on an adoption to, I'm sorry, an ordinance to, or is, 
is a public hearing and the adoption of an ordinance to amend the OPV allocation ordinance to comply with the decision and order in the Oxnard, um, the city of Oxnard's lawsuit against the agency. Um, adoption of an ordinance at today's meeting is necessary to comply with a April 8th court deadline to return, uh, to submit a return um, to the court's writ of mandate. Um, and the, the agency has prepared a proposed ordinance, which is exhibit number one, which is attached to item number five, the board letter for item number five in your agenda today. So a little bit of background. Um, the GMA adopted the OPV allocation ordinance in October of 2019. Uh, the ordinance was developed over several years in response and with significant um, stakeholder input. Uh, the city opposed uh, provisions that granted Pleasant Valley and United additional allocation or allocation flexibility and requested that those provisions be deleted or that the city be given additional allocation. Um, the city's lawsuit challenges the adoption of the ordinance and that, and that lawsuit was um, was filed in December of 2019. The city's lawsuit claims, uh, makes three claims primarily, that it violated section 106 of the water code by including a preference for agricultural operators, um, that it violated section 702 of the GMA's enabling legislation uh, because it regulates the city more restrictively than other operators in the OPV basin, and that it violated, that the adoption of the ordinance violated CEQA. Um, the court, the court decided that the uh, ordinance violated section 106 of the water code and that the ordinance violated uh, section 702 of the GMA's enabling legislation, but it did find that the adoption of the ordinance did not uh, violate the, did not violate CEQA. Um, based on these findings, the court issued a writ of mandate that ordered the agency to set aside section 10.2 of the ordinance, which is the part that violated the water code and rescind or revise provisions of Article 6 of the ordinance that violate Section 702 of the agency's enabling legislation. So let's talk about each of these violations in particular. I'm going to quickly go through the water code violation one. Um, water, code vi water code Section 106 provides, it's essentially state policy, and it essentially establishes as the highest use of water in the state to be domestic use and the second highest use to be agricultural use. Um, section seven, I'm sorry, section 10.2 in our ordinance um, provides a um, minimum allocation to agricultural operators and then uh, expresses an intent to um, exempt those minimum allocations from ramp down when and if and when your board decides to ramp down. Uh, the court found that that section, section 10.2, states an intent to protect agricultural operators but not domestic operators and thus prioritizes irrigation or agriculture over domestic purposes in violation of the water code policy. So um, consistent with the court's uh, order, the proposed ordinance uh, deletes in its entirety section 10.2. No real issue there. Moving on to the 702 violations, the violations of the agency's ordinance, um, the enabling legislation, I'm sorry. Uh, the court found that the uh, OPV allocation ordinance, specifically section six, or provisions in section six of the ordinance violated section 702 of the GMA Act. Um, in the OPV ordinance, uh, section six includes, uh, you know, it, um, section six sets allocation, e extraction allocations for all operators in the OPV basins. In most cases, those allocations are based on the average annual groundwater extractions that occurred or that were made by an operator during a 20, 2005, 2005 through 2014 base period. These allocations are known as base period allocations. It's worth noting that Article 6, which includes all these extraction, um, which sets extraction allocations, you know, is based on all of the agency's previous extraction allocations. So they did not occur in a vacuum. Um, they take into account previous allocation ordinances and systems that were in place, uh, were put in place by the agency, as well as the reality that this agency has approved a number of different projects that, have, that may have affected individual operators' allocations during the base period or even prior to the base period. So while Article 6 sets allocations, base period allocations for um, all operators, 
uh, based on the base period, it does make some exceptions. And those two exceptions are known as the Conejo Creek project provision or section, as well as the Santa Clara River Flex section. Um, both of those provisions were afforded to the respective operators in the Conejo Creek provision. It's the uh, it's Pleasant Valley County Groundwater Agency uh, or district, but in the SCR flex provision, it's United and PV. Those provisions, those sections were included to recognize the coordinated use of surface water by those operators that occurred during the base period. Notwithstanding the, or because of the inclusion of those provisions and the fact that no similar provision was made available to the city, uh, the court found that these provisions uh, violate section 702 of the GMA Act and ordered the GMA to rescind or revise them. So let's talk a little bit about how this 702 works because it will influence how we decided to prepare our proposed ordinance. Generally speaking, or the, the language of 702 provides that the availability of supplemental water to any operator shall not subject that operator to regulations more restrictive than those imposed on other operators. The city purchased supplemental water from Cayegas. Because of that purchase, um, I'm sorry, because, the, because it purchased supplemental water, because the city suppl purchased supplemental water, the OPV allocation ordinance cannot regulate the city more restrictively than other operators. The OPV or the OPV ordinances Conejo Creek section and Santa Clara River section, Santa Clara River Flex section, provide flexibility to PV and United based on their access to supplemental water. Because the ordinance provides flexibility to United and PV, but not to the city, the court found that the uh, OPV ordinance regulates the city more restrictively. Accordingly, the court ordered. GMA to rescind or revise the provisions that uh, violate Article 6 of the allocation ordinance. So based on the presentation given to your board at the February meeting, um, your board provided direction to staff to prepare an ordinance that complied with the court's order, did not repeal the entire OPV allocation ordinance or the entirety of section six of the OPV ordinance and avoided adversely impacting the basins. In general, the staff's approach to preparing the proposed ordinance was to provide the flexibility that were afforded to PV and United under the, the Conejo Creek provision and the Santa Clara River provision to more operators so as to avoid section 702 violations. With that approach in mind, the proposed ordinance continues to set base period allocations based on operators' groundwater use, um, except those extractions subject to surcharges that occur during the base period. The proposed ordinance retains the Conejo Creek project section, but does add a new take requirement. And it retains the Santa Clara River Flex provision. In the proposed ordinance then amends section six of the ordinance to include new sections to provide increased allocation and flexibility similar to those provided to PV and United under the Conejo Creek project section and the Santa Clara River Flex provision. Those provisions like the Conejo Creek, those new provisions like the Conejo Creek provision as well as the Santa Clara River Flex section um, are designed to take into account the coordinated use of operators' groundwater and supplemental slash surface water during the base period that resulted in some specific types of um, benefits to the basins. And we'll get into those in a second. So the existing Conejo Creek project section increases PV's allocation based on a finding that during the base period, groundwater pumping within the PV service area decreased below then allocations by the amount of Conejo Creek project water delivered to PV. Um, previous GMA resolutions approved coordinated use of Conejo Creek project water. There's a resolution and an agreement between PV and Cam Rosa that approved the transfer of allocation due to PV's reduced extraction to Cam Rosa. All of Camarosa's wells are located outside of the pumping trough depression or the pumping trough management area. 
and thus the transfer of PV allocation to Camarosa resulted in base and benefits by moving pumping from a management area to a non-management area. And the resolution referenced here, as well as the agreement referenced here, occurred or were entered into at least in some form or some prior iteration prior to the adoption of the OPV ordinance. Point being that a lot of these programs were in place prior to the adoption of the OPV allocation ordinance and the ordinance as adopted is essentially laid on top of. So while it did its best to account for um, or provide a modified extraction based on these programs, um, there was the understanding that agreements, existing agreements and existing resolutions were in place at the time the ordinance was adopted. Specifically, the Conejo Creek project section increases PV's allocation by an amount equal to the average annual surface water deliveries that it received from the Conejo Creek project during the base period, but it requires that increased, I'm sorry, it requires that increased PV allocation be reduced every year by the amount that of Conejo Creek project water delivered to PV. There's no requirement in the PV, I'm sorry, in the Conejo Creek project section to take any amount of uh, Conejo Creek project water delivered to PV. There's only a requirement that um, its adjusted allocation would be reduced by the amount that it receives. But without a take requirement, the ordinance does not ensure PV's continued coordinated use of Conejo Creek project water. And that's something we want to continue, right, is that during the base period there was coordinated use of surface water, supplemental water. Um, we, while the ordinance wants to give credit, or maybe not credit, but wants to account for that, um, for the, the diminished use of, extra, or the diminished extractions below then allocations that occurred during the base period, we want to continue those into the future as well. So with the underlying approach of trying to provide similar benefits under each program, the proposed ordinance adds a new section that provides adjusted allocation or increased allocations uh, for operators that can demonstrate, can make a demonstration similar to that made by PV, which is what we're gonna talk about here. So again, it's intended to provide increased allocation to operators similar to Conejo Creek project section the new section provides that provides an increased allocation to an operator that demonstrates that it coordinated its use of supplemental and surface water with its groundwater during the base period that resulted in either a reduction in its annual groundwater extraction below its allocation effective during the base period or a transfer of that allocation from a management area to a non-management area during the base period. In any year that the operator receives supplemental or surface water, the increased allocation would be reduced by the amount of surface water, supplemental water received. The new section also requires operators to accept and use that amount of supplemental surface water made available for coordinated use with groundwater during the base period, up to that amount that they had shown um, for which they had uh, received an increased uh, adjustment. So, that provision there also would require that water made available to an operator getting an increased allocation would be required to take it. However, it's not expressed here, but as you'll see in the language in the proposed ordinance, they're not required to take an unlimited amount. They're only required to take up to that amount for which they received an increased allocation, which is due to their coordinated use of groundwater and surface water during the base period. <laughs> In this way, the new adjusted allocation section accounts for the coordinated use of groundwater and supplemental surface water made by operators during the base period and ensures the continued coordinated use of such water supplies during, that occurred during the base period. As a, the proposed ordinance, the only change that we made to the existing Conejo Creek project provision is to include a take requirement so that the two provisions are similar that and there's no disparate treatment between PV and operators that otherwise might be entitled to in an increased allocation or an adjusted allocation under the new section. This new section creates an opportunity and a process for operators to receive an increased base period allocation upon demonstrating that their coordinated use of groundwater and surface water during the base period 
resulted in either corresponding reductions to an extraction below a then allocation, a, a, a below the then applicable allocation during the base period, or the transfer of allocation um, from a management area to a non-management area during the base period. Because it establishes a process, it does not predetermine any operator's eligibility for an increased um, allocation. Uh, process provides all operators with access to supplemental surface water the opportunity to obtain an increased allocation. This process also allows the GMA time to determine operators' coordinated use of groundwater and supplemental surface water during the base period. It doesn't require the GMA to actually determine immediately all sources of supplemental water in the basins, all operators with access to supplemental water, and the amount of increased allocation amongst the operators, excuse me, that might otherwise be eligible for an increased allocation. It also allows the GMA to, instead of rushing through this process, it allows us a certain amount of time to deliberately review those requests for increased or adjusted allocation with the hope that, uh, with the hope of avoiding unintended consequences such as allocation windfalls, new or exacer exacerbated impacts to the basin. <coughs> so the other 702 vi violation found by the court was the uh, Santa Clara River Flex provision. Or pro program section. That section provides that PV and United provides PV and United a flexible allocation based on the finding that in any given year, deliveries from Santa Clara River water to customers via the uh, PV pipeline and the PTP pipeline reduce these customers' uh, groundwater allocations or groundwater extractions. In years when the Santa Clara River water is less uh, than what was available on average during the base period, PV and United's allocations are increased by an amount equal to the difference between average base period Santa Clara River water availability and actual Santa Clara River water availability during that year. Uh, it allows for more groundwater pumping in dry years. In years when Santa Clara River water is more abundant than what was available on average during the base period, PV and United's allocations are decreased by an amount equal to the difference between actual Santa Clara River water deliveries or availability during that year and the average base period Santa Clara River water availability. The Santa Clara River water program also includes a take requirement such that in years when PV and United do not make full use of the surface water available to them, PV and United's allocation for that year shall be reduced by an amount of available surface water not taken by PV and United. The program also provides that PV and United's allocations may only be reduced by 50% in order to provide United and PV a minimum allocation when Santa Clara River water is not available. PV and United surcharges are determined on a rolling five-year basis. If PV and United are determined to exceed an allocation under this five-year rolling, on this five-year rolling average, surcharges uh, will be assessed in all, in all previous years. Uh, the Santa Clara River Flex program also requires United to prepare and submit annual reports on Santa Clara River water availability during the preceding year. So consistent with, this, with staff's approach of providing flexibility similar to existing ordinance provisions, um, the proposed ordinance adds a new Cayagas Flex program. It's designed to provide operators with access to Cayagas water, like the city, allocation flexibility similar to PV and United under the Santa Clara River Flex program. Program would be limited to uh, Cayagas or operators that have access to Cayagas water. And it would work very similarly to the uh, Santa Clara River Flex program provision. In years when Cayagas water is less than what was available on average during the base period, it would allow an operator to increase its base period groundwater allocation based on the difference. But in years when Cayagas water is more abundant, than what was available on average during the base period, it would decrease an operator's base period groundwater allocation. Requires, it also includes a take requirement, such that it requires Cayagas operators or operators with access to Cayagas water that actually make use 
of the Santa Clara River, or I'm sorry, of the flex. It would require them to um, make full use of the Cayagas water then available. It's essentially a take requirement. In addition, like the Santa Clara River Flex program, if an operator fails to make use of water then available in the operator's base period, groundwater extraction for that year, uh, extraction allocation for that year shall be reduced by the amount of Cayagas water made available but not taken by the operator. Like the SCR or Santa Clara River Flex provision, surcharges would be, would be determined on a rolling five-year average basis such that if um, surcharges were owed after a review of uh, five years worth of water use. Um, if surcharges were owed on that amount, they would be evenly distributed amongst each of the previous water years or reporting years. Um, the new Cayagas uh, Flex program would require operators to prepare and submit annual reports based on the availability of Cayagas water during the preceding year. The one distinction between the Santa Clara River Flex Program and the um, new Cayagas Flex Program is that it does not include a minimum allocation for operators taking advantage of the Flex Program. The Santa Clara River Flex Program provided PV and United a minimum allocation in recognition of the reality that Santa Clara River water may not be available in some years. It may vary significantly from year to year. Cayagas doesn't have that problem. So operators with access to Cayagas water, let me say that differently, Cayagas water is generally always available. So operators are not subject to a similar constraint such that we did not include in the new Cayagas section any, any minimum allocation like there is in the Santa Clara River Flex provision. I apologize, I did not advance the slides. Let's see, here we go. Finally, the proposed, the proposed ordinance is exempt from CEQA for the same reasons that the court found that it was the original OPV allocation ordinance was exempt from CEQA. It's exempt from CEQA under um, water code section uh, 10728.6, which um, exempts pr um, the preparation and adoption of GSPs, but not necessarily the projects related to GSP implementation. The court found that this exemption applies to the OPV ordinance. It should similarly apply to the proposed ordinance um, because of it, it's just the proposed ordinance is more or less an extension of and conforming the um, provisions that otherwise violate section 702 with the existing or the originally enacted OPV ordinance. Um, the court also found that the adoption of the OPV ordinance lacks the potential for causing a significant effect on the environment and that there's no possibility that it may have a significant effect on the environment. Um, the, the proposed ordinance does not disrupt or change any, in any materially significant way the extractions that would otherwise be allowed under the ordinance such that the common sense or CEQA's common sense exception would continue to apply here. In addition, the adoption of the proposed ordinance would be exempt from CEQA um, under those uh, categorical exemptions that provide or that exempt ordinances or programs that are designed to protect the environment and natural resources. Just, just like the original OPV allocation ordinance, the proposed ordinance would establish um, allocations um, so as to transition the agency from its current management programs to sustainable management programs, avoid exacerbating basin impacts. All of these things are consistent with protecting or enhancing the groundwater supply that is the environment or the natural resources and otherwise would be exempt under both of these exemptions to CEQA. So with that, the agency recommends uh, you receive and file this board letter and presentation, conduct a hearing on adoption of the proposed ordinance, adopt the proposed ordinance, and find that the adoption of the proposed ordinance is exempt from CEQA. Thank you, Jason. Any questions or comments from the board before we convene a public hearing on the matter? Um, thank you. I, I appreciate you giving me the recap on you know, the slides 13 and 14, what United's position was and how United's affected and what they can and cannot do. And as you know, United has 
so many different options on how they capture water down the river and uh, do their recharge. But the, the biggest concern that we want to make sure of is that, um, that the language does not affect in any way our existing allocations. As proposed, the, the proposed ordinance does not change any language in the Santa Clara River Flex program. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Jason, <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. I hope you can hear me OK. Thanks for your presentation. Um, the board received this morning a letter from the from special counsel for city of Oxnard, and I want to uh, make sure that I understand what your response is to a couple of the assertions in that letter. And at the bottom of page three of that letter, <clears throat> it states, and I quote, the most egregious defect in the staff report's proposed amendment is the requirement imposed on the city and other Cayugas users to take available Cayugas water at a cost of $1,730 per acre foot or more in order to avoid being penalized with a lower base period extraction allocation. Of course, this is all within the context of an interpretation of Section 702. What is your response to that assertion? That claim raises a number of different issues. I think one of the first ones that I would address is the fact that the agency does not have authority over what Cayugas charges. Um, we could, I mean, it, that's just the fact, right? I mean, the, re the reality of it is, is we're trying to provide a flex program similar to the Santa Clara River Flex program. Uh, we have no um, authority, or the agency does not have any authority over the cost um, associated with um, the delivery of Santa Clara River water, nor does it have any control over the cost of uh, purchase or the delivery of Cayugas water. So in part, we are, we are doing those things that we can in order to provide flexibility for all operators, on an, on, provide, all, provide flexibility for all operators. Those things that are outside of our control are outside of our control and we only have, and we cannot address. Um, so, does that rise? I think that the city and um, staff and uh, agency council have a difference of opinion about what constitutes or may constitute a uh, Section 702 violation. It would be our position that the amount of um, money that would be charged uh, for the um, delivery of supplemental surface water in any given case by any given operator would be outside the control of uh, the agency. So just to follow, if I may, Mr. Chair, just to follow with, a, with another question, if I'm looking at <clears throat> Section 702 in the, uh, in the Authorizing Act as a matter of law, and I quote, the availability of supplemental water to any operator shall not subject that operator to regulations more restrictive than those imposed on other operators. If, am I understanding your position to be, am I correctly understanding your position to be that uh, the agency is not imposing regulations more restrictive uh, than uh, those imposed on other operators by virtue of this program? Since it has, let me just finish, since it has no control over the cost of the water being utilized uh, by that Cayugas operator. I mean, have I distilled the legal argument correctly? I think that our position is, is our position is that it's not agency regulation subjecting the city to uh, increased price uh, points. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Any other questions or comments from the board? At this time, then, we'll con convene a public hearing concerning the proposed amendments to um, the uh, allocation ordinance, the OPV allocation ordinance, and invite any members of the public wishing to address the board to come forward and do so now. Good afternoon, honorable chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Gregory Newmark. I am special counsel for the city of Oxnard in city of Oxnard versus Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. Um, appreciate the opportunity to address the board. Um, we also would like to thank the agency staff and, and council, Mr. Kanger, for 
for meeting with us uh, several times um, after, during the lawsuit, after the judgment was entered to see whether we could get on the same page to support um, revisions to the allocation ordinance. Um, as you're aware from the letter that I uh, sent this morning, we weren't able to get there. <clears throat> um, it does sound like the board received the letter, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, as stated in the staff report, you know, the reason that this ordinance is being amended is because the court found that the existing um, ordinance violates Section 702 of the Agency's Enabling Act. So Section 702 is, is quoted um, at page three of the staff report in the middle of the page when interpreting a statute, um, as I know we have a couple of lawyers on the board know, um, courts will typically look at um, what was the legislature's goal in enacting that statute. Um, and I'm wondering if there's, I, I'm sure you've all looked at the statute and it's quoted in the staff report, it's part of your enabling act. Um, we talked about it, it was on Mr. Kanter's slides. Um, I wondered if anyone, from just to see whether we can have a dialogue here, if there's either the chair or any of the members of the board could share with the public what the board believes the legislature's goal was in including section 702 in the Enabling Act. You're welcome to address the board. If the board has a question or a comment, I'm sure they'll respond. I was trying to see whether we, I could be helpful in seeing whether we have a common understanding of that, but I understand that you can ask questions of me and I can only ask if you're willing to share your thoughts with, with me and the rest of the public. Um, so uh, apparently you want to at least wait to let us know what you think. Um, so I'll, I'll say, you know, we know that the goal, the stated goal of the entire act and the reasons for creating the agency because the legislature told us in section 102 of the act. <coughs> And what the legislature said was it hereby finds and declares that the preservation of the groundwater resources within the territory of the agency for agricultural and municipal and industrial uses in, are in the public interest and that the creation of the agency pursuant to this act is for the common benefit of all water users. And the reason that, that I mentioned that here and we're thinking about how do we interpret section 702 and Mr. Kandra's right, we have a difference of opinion as to um, how that act should be applied to um, the regulations that this agency has been adopting. Um, so the entire purpose of, the, of your enabling legislation and every provision in that act is to further the goal of preserving local groundwater resources. And so provisions like section 702 are not unique to this agency's ground um, enabling act. There are other special act jurisdictions throughout the state that have similar provisions which we would submit are intended to incentivize use groundwater users within that jurisdiction to invest in obtaining access to new sources of water, to supplemental sources of water, to help augment the water resources available to the region in general and to that user in particular. And the reason that it's important to have a provision like Section 702 where the legislature has said, if you invest and obtain the availability of supplemental water, you won't be subjected to more um, restrictive regulation, is to encourage people to do that. Because what happened here, and what the court found here, is that the city was penalized, was subjected to more restrictive regulation by virtue of its base period allocation being reduced. The pumping that the city conducted during the base period was reduced because it was taking significant amounts of Cayugas water. So that was the more restrictive regulation that was being addressed by the court. Um, unfortunately, all the staff proposals in front of you today, um, we believe also impose probably even worse, even more dire, even more severe restrictive regulation than the regulation you're amend the ordinance you're, you're amending right now. So what this agency was told to correct was the penalization of the city and having a reduced base period alloc allocation. So in the, both provisions that are before this board include an obligation to the city 
uh, and other Cayugas users to take available water from Cayugas. In um, the first set of provisions modeled on the Caneo Creek program, uh, there's an obligation to take up to the amount that this, you know, the user took during the base period. And in the second provision model on the Santa Clara River Flex program, there's no limit. It just says take all of the Cayugas water that's available. Um, and presumably, as I outlined in my letter, that would mean you would keep taking <laughs> until there's uh, no groundwater allocation left to, to allocate. So that'd be about 20,000 acre feet for the city. Um, and so while it may be true, as Mr. Kanger says, that this board doesn't set rates for uh, what Cayugas charges its user, doesn't set um, what the contractual terms are that were agreed to between um, Pleasant Valley County Water District um, and Camarosa to purchase their water, um, doesn't have much to say about um, what costs United presumably does not incur to divert water off of the Santa Clara River um, to uh, maximize its own surface water rights. Um, but it certainly has control over the provisions that are in this ordinance, <clears throat> knowing full well that this water costs the city at least $1,730 per acre foot, requiring the city to buy, in the first provision, at least 12,061 acre feet of that water. Um, and in the second set model in the Santa Clara River Flex, requiring the city to buy as much as, avail as is available. And as we demonstrated, that would actually, at some point, go out of the tier one $1,730 an acre foot cost and into tier two, where it would be, for 2024, over $1,900 an acre foot. So whether or not this agency controls the cost, um, I, you know, you may not control the cost of what Mercedes charges to buy a car, but if you tell me I have to go buy a Mercedes, I'm going to have to pay for one, <laughs> whatever they're charging, whatever I can get it for. So this is, in the city's view, clearly more restrictive regulation. We think that it actually undermines the legislative purpose of Section 702. Section 702 was enacted to um, encourage operators to obtain access to supplemental water. After seeing what is proposed to happen to the city of Oxnard and other Cayugas users here, where we're gonna be required to pay millions and millions of dollars every year as a you know, no good deed goes unpunished type of situation, um, who would invest in, in getting access to supplemental water now? It, it discourages that investment. As we explained, the city has worked hard along with many other users in the basin to reduce its total water use. And they've, they've been working at doing that and they've been successful in reducing the total water use since the base period. So while the city used over 12,000 acre feet of Cayugas water during the base period, um, as I explained in my letter and we provided evidence, um, in 2022 we took about 8,000 acre feet um, and in 2023 we took less than 8,000 acre feet, 77,000 acre feet. So to require the city as a part of this ordinance to avoid the penalization of the reduced base period allocation to purchase up to the base period or even more under some provisions, but just up to the base period is over 4,000 acre feet. That's over $7,000 on the disadvantaged communities served by Oxnard's water utility. So you can probably tell from my comments, um, the city doesn't believe that the proposed ordinance that's before this board to adopt um, will comply with Section 702. Uh, we don't believe that it will comply with the court's writ of mandate. Um, Uh, we, we think that this will adversely affect not only Oxnard because it applies to um, all users similarly, similarly situated that have access to, to Cayugas water. Um, it's very unclear to us how this ordinance would actually operate, um, how you would measure the reductions under the first set of provisions, um, what would happen if you don't comply with the tick obligation in the 
provisions uh, modeled on the Caneo Creek or even if PV doesn't comply with its take obligation. Um, there are a lot of um, questions as to how it would be, um, how it would actually operate. But I do wonder for, for um, those board members who um, are affiliated with agencies that, that also take Cayugas water, like uh, Mayor Tremblay um, and Supervisor Long, um, who represent agencies that take um, Cayugas water. I would hope that you would be concerned for the impact on your city, for Camarillo, for example. We understand that given the court's order, um, Camarillo is taken, I think, in the documentation we provided from Cayugas, uh, attached to my declaration, a little, little more than 4,000 acre feet a year from Cayugas after uh, over the past 10 years. It's not exactly the base period, but the most recent past 10 years. Um, so that's a, at current cost, that's about like $7 million of investment by, by um, ratepayers. Um, in the same way that um, Oxnard was penalized by having a reduced base period allocation, um, Camarillo's utility was penalized by having a reduced base period allocation by taking that same water. If there's a take obligation imposed on, on these users, um, our understanding is that Camarillo will have to continue taking up to 4,000 acre feet or more of Cayugas water, um, even when your desalter comes online, even if you have other programs where you would normally want to cut down your highest co cost water first, you'll be penalized for doing that. So we feel it's unfair, it sets the wrong message, it works across purposes with the legislative goal. Um, I just want to close my comments um, by saying, uh, you know, the city did offer numerous other alternative approaches. We offered adjustments as to how we, if the if staff felt it had to go on something modeled on the Caneo Creek program, how it could be adjusted to avoid a 702 violation. We offered suggestions on how something loosely modeled in the Santa Clara River Flex program could be change to avoid a section 702 violation. We proposed something more uniquely um, tailored to address uh, M&I users with access to Cayugas water that we thought would be a great benefit to the basin that would allow um, the cities the, to underpump their allocation and start storing water in the basin. Um, and then if there comes a time where they need to over pump their allocation, they'd be able to do that so long as that's offset later. Um, we included that at the back of my letter just for reference that what we think would be the best um, approach. We attempted to draft actual language for the ordinance and um, didn't get any markup back on that from staff. Um, but the city has time and again tried to make clear that it really feels like there is a, a big opportunity for partnership with this board um, at working towards achieving sustainable, sustainability for management of this basin and um, increasing the water resources available to Oxnard's disadvantaged communities and many of whom actually participate and require, you know, rely on the prosperity of the agricultural economy that surrounds it. So we feel like this we're in disagreement as to whether the, the staff proposal would comply with the court's order, but we're looking for opportunities to partner with this board to develop proposals that will encourage development of new water resources, encourage entities to store water in the basin, to increase the groundwater levels, and bring us closer to sustainability. We feel like if, if the board were to adopt an approach like Oxnard had, had suggested, that would be something that you could put in your next GSP report, demonstrate to DWR that you're taking some good actions to move towards sustainability. So we're at, we're at loggerheads now, but I do want to say that we're still always looking for opportunities to work with this board to um, get closer to consensus and move closer to sustainable groundwater management. Thank you, Council. Appreciate it. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you.
afternoon, uh, Chair West, members of the board, Jared Bouchard with uh, Pleasant Valley County Water District. Um, I'm not sure where to where to start, but I, I think given the discussion here, um, I, I want to provide a little background and, and say that I think we agree with the city on some 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 level and a, and a lot. Uh, when we go into these things, the, the agency had a history of incentivizing programs and projects. Pleasant Valley County Water District, for one, I don't want to talk about everybody else as engaged in those projects. Caneo Creek Project in partnership with Cayegas and Camarosa originally, 2014 being, became just a Camarosa PV project prior to any of these rules because there was an incentive to do so. The ordinance when adopted, I didn't intend on talking about, about it, but I think it's important. Uh, PV was up here talking about the risk of this ordinance when adopted in 2019 and what it does. What the ordinance essentially did when it was adopted is it took those that engaged in groundwater projects within the basin during 2005 to 14 and said, you, get additional risk that the pure groundwater pumper does not. That's what the ordinance set up. And here we are, less than four years down the road from the adoption of that, and we're revisiting it. That's concerning. People said that we were schizophrenic. We were being overly concerned about issues within the ordinance when it was adopted. And we made these same statements about penalizing those that participated in projects. We didn't need the GMA oversight at that time for the 25 plus years of those projects, well, Santa Clara River waters, 60, 70 years of history in taking that water. The Caneo Creek project, 20, 25 years of that project. We didn't need anybody to tell us to take it. We did it. We did it without the GMA's oversight. The foundation of this ordinance when it was originally adopted says, you participated in projects, now guess what? your project water now has additional risk associated with it that the pure groundwater pumper doesn't. Your allocation has additional risk. And if you don't behave in a way that we tell you to, you will get that water taken away. Now we're taking a step further in that and mandating the take of that water. And I will remind you back in 2019 how we got here and why there wasn't a take requirement under the Caneo Creek is because this board had adopted multiple resolutions they had a con we have a contract in place that has a take or pay requirement. You have resolutions that were in order that uh, resolution 1302, which regardless of whether or not you guys rescinded it today, it's in the contract I have or PV does with Camarosa that requires us to prioritize the use of that water. Nobody had to augment our behavior. We did it because it's the right thing for the basin. The current structure of the ordinance does not incentivize the use of whether it be supplemental water, whatever you want to call them, conjunctive use, it does not support that. I understand this board is under a time frame to get something back to manage the writ. I get it. I don't know how to solve that problem for you. However, going forward, I implore upon this board that we have an opportunity to work together with the water community and the path that we have taken thus far is not supporting that. It creates very distinct risk for us. If the Caneo Creek project were to dry up tomorrow and that water doesn't get delivered within the ordinance, whether it be the amended ordinance or the current one, your board has the ability to come back to PV and say, guess what? Because you participated in that project during our base period, we're gonna strip you of one third of your available allocation. Because we participated in a project that was good for the basin, that's what it sets up. That's what it sets up. And we need to give careful thought to that in how we manage these projects. I don't know how to resolve your 702 problem today other than to say we all got to get in a room and have very careful and thoughtful consideration about how we develop these projects. Maybe trying to fit this square peg of Cayegas water into the round hole of Caneo Creek water doesn't make sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense to try and fit it into the Santa Clara River Flex. Maybe it needs its own independent program that has basin benefit to be developed within it. I know we don't have the time to do that between now and April 8th, but uh, we need to have those conversations because right now this is, this is not uh, helpful from what, what we're hearing. Um, 
uh, again, I, I, I didn't intend on saying a lot of this, but um, the, the other thing I'll say within the staff report, it's, uh, 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 or the, the presentation, it talked about Camarosa getting the benefit and pumping outside of the, uh, outside of the, the area. I just want your board to be aware that um, every bit of the offset of pumping that has occurred underneath that program, absent the supplemental M&I water program taking advantage of it, that water's stored in the ground. Camarosa hasn't fully exercised the amount of uh, transfers that have occurred. If they have, it's been very little. That water's stored there. This project has been a great project for the basin. <laughs> And, and we're putting the very users of it at additional risk that a pure groundwater user doesn't. Um, so I, I would implore upon us to come back to the drawing board when we have that opportunity and make it swift and quick to try and develop uh, an, an ordinance that works for everybody that takes that risk away. Um, I'll, I'll leave, that, leave that alone and go to knowing that your board is going to take some action today and address uh, the, the revisions that specifically uh, affect Pleasant Valley County Water District. Um, my assumption standing here is that we're not going to strip the new take language out of it. That would be my first request that we, we take it out of there. It's not necessary for Pleasant Valley County Water District. The controls are in place. That's why it was originally adopted the way that it was and we've continued to behave in that way. So this is section 6.2.1 that adds the additional take requirement. If the board is going to continue forward with the amendment as proposed, I would request under section the new section 6.2.1, this is the uh, second sentence begins, in each year in which Pleasant Valley receives Caneo Creek water deliveries, comma, and then a new sentence is inserted. Pleasant Valley must accept for delivery and use Caneo Creek water deliveries. I would ask that after that, right there, Caneo Creek water deliveries made available up to the average amount of base period Caneo Creek deliveries. That that simple change go in there. And what it, if you want an explanation of why, I'll give it to you, but I'm not gonna bore you with it. I'll wait to have the question asked. I think it makes sense, it makes it consistent with the other provisions as they've been modified within, within the, uh, the amended language. Um, and so I'm happy to answer why PV would, would request that that's in there, but I'll leave it alone for now. Would you just repeat the, requ the request you made? Yeah, so the new section 6.2.1 that's being added, and I, I'm reading from the line strikeout version, not the, not the clean copy. Uh, the second sentence of that uh, starts in each year in which Pleasant Valley receives Canal Creek water deliveries, comma, and then the new language that's requested is Pleasant Valley, or excuse me, the new language inserted by staff that's in here is Pleasant Valley must accept for delivery and use Canal Creek water deliveries. Right there, I would ask that we add Canal Creek water deliveries made available by Camarosa up to the average amount of base period Canal Creek water deliveries. It doesn't fundamentally change what you guys are asking to be done, but it provides us a little more protection than saying, hey, if one, one drop of water is delivered in that year, you had to meet this average amount. We're not in control of how that river performs any more than anybody can hear can make it rain. So if the water gets delivered, we're going to use it and we're going to continue to behave in the way that we have in the past. That's all. And that there, there's no adverse impact to us if the water doesn't show up. Can I ask you a question? Please. Were you here at the last meeting? Probably, I don't know about for the full conversation. Okay, because yeah. I know we've been talking about this stuff for a long time, and so we're just as frustrated as you to have to be going through all this, and I mean, I just want you to know you're not alone in this, and, and so it's trying to be fair to all, all personnel, I just, that tone, I just was doing a check because um, it just I was receiving that kind of off. And so I just wanted to make sure that you were, you've been in these meetings and uh, yeah, the, I appreciate your feedback is, is I really do. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to gauge where the comments were coming from. So 
Yeah, I, I'm trying to understand that, that your board's under a time frame to put something back there. Uh, we had a chance to meet with staff and express our concerns about okay, this good. in advance. Um, you know, staff had felt it needed to be in there, so it's there. I'm trying to be constructive within the confines of what I know cool. is going to occur here today and try and just make minor tweaks. Um, in hopes that there's a broader conversation to be had later. So no, I, uh, I appreciate that. That's why I wanted to just make sure because I haven't yeah. worked with you in this way, and so I wanted to do make sure I did a check on that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the other request that Pleasant Valley would have that uh, I hope is non-controversial is the new added section of 6.4. I believe should be struck in its entirety. It's very, very vague language that leaves it open to, it, you know, it sounds, we love to use crazy analogies, but someone could ask, hey, you got to have God himself show up here in order to uh, make, that, make that claim. Uh, it just says that they can ask for any additional information in order to compliance. The ordinance itself already tells us what we need to do. We need to provide water availability reports. We need to provide reports to the GMA. So I don't think that language is necessary and I don't believe it provides enough clear direction to both the end users of it or to staff in a policy setting. Uh, so I think section 6.4 should be struck in its entirety. Um, and uh, with that, the, the only other suggestion or, or uh, being somebody that, that does this as well, uh, I, maybe it's a question or a suggestion, but I would I would hope that we will get one single document that this is amending the existing ordinance. It's tough to jump back and forth, and the, some of the citations, if I'm reading it correctly, to reference certain sections as to how they'll be implemented are either incorrect within the modified version or uh, so. I'm happy to share those with staff, but I, I don't think they're material. Um, in that uh, they, they would stop your board if they're just edification of it. We know the intent, but um, there are certain sections, uh, for example, if, if staff just wants to take a look, uh, section 6.5.3 uh, references to section 6.2.18, I believe, which I believe has been revised. It should be pointing to the new section 6.5.8. Um, and there's a few of those in there. Uh, just. Uh, where, where it's referencing to. So um, that may be just confusion because we're doing an amended ordinance versus the existing one. I don't know. Can I ask you another question then? Please. So the 6.4, as I read it, states that it may. Yeah. And, and I go back and forth on other boards. May, shall, should, could. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a may ask for any additional. So you think that that's wrong, that we could ask for any additional if we needed a clarification? The, yeah, I think the problem is that it doesn't define what they may ask for. Like I said, that's very broad. Okay, uh, so there's a trust issue and a fear that you're going to ask for tax documents and all this other stuff, or I, I apologize, I'm not in your water business as much as you are. So I'm, I'm wanting to get a better understanding. Like, is it certain documents, like additional water documents? Is there a I, word I, in there? I think in this case, I think the ordinance as a whole, if you take it in a whole, already prescribes what's necessary. That thoughtfulness was put into it, what's necessary to demonstrate the continued compliance with the programs. Uh -huh. It's in there. The requirements are there. Uh, if you're somebody new coming in, it talks about what they need to demonstrate. That That's all there, right? Okay. Uh, we already had to go through that process with PV during the initial adoption of this. Uh -huh. I, I just don't think it's fair to leave it open-ended to say we, they could ask for anything under the sun. And that's that's not to say Jason's going to do that, Arnie's going to do right. that. But So is there any particular type of document like that they would need additional, like additional water verification document or it's already listed in the already ordinance is why i say that it exists in there okay and, and this is a very broad broad section that just le leaves it open okay and, and so i that's just my just opinion checking. of it okay um i i guess well may, i'll i'll leave it alone for now because if there's a broader conversation to be had i'll yeah. take it up then thank you thank you Jared. Chair West, members of the board, my name is Ian Frischard. I'm at Cayugas Municipal Water District. 
and uh, Supervisor Long, I was not at the last meeting. Uh, and I have to admit to not having paid extremely close attention to the OPV allocation discussion because not having an allocation in the OPV basin, I didn't think that Cuyagas needed to pay super close attention. We have not, Cuyagas has not been contacted um, as regards our participation in this portion of the allocation ordinance. And to some of the discussion or comments made earlier, um, what works for Santa Clara Riverflex and the Conejo Creek pumping program is probably not gonna work exactly the same way for Cuyagas. And, and I have some, as late as I am coming to this, some concerns about, as uh, Mr. Newmark mentioned, the operational um, aspects of how the allocation, um, the program laid out in the ordinance would work. First of all, Cuyagas provides supplemental water to our purveyors, we call them our customers, our retail customers we call purveyors. Uh, we don't have purchase orders with our customers. There are no take or pay agreements with our customers. So how the GMA, a question that I have is how does the GMA envision coordination with us as a supplier of supplemental surface water and you know, what would Cuyagas, the anticipated involvement of us as a supplier that surface supplemental water be, and most importantly, as someone else has mentioned, is, is how are we gonna determine what, whether, whether Cuyagas has abundant supply or does not have enough water to supply the base amount. Um, I just, I don't know because we haven't talked about it and I haven't given it enough thought how we would do that. And that <coughs> seems to me to be a critical, crit pretty critical piece of how this program would work. And as <coughs> Greg said, and as Jared said, Cuyagas is very interested in figuring these types of programs out. And I think it's doable. I just don't think that the program as presented in the ordinance today is gonna work. <coughs> Thank you again. Anyone else? Uh, good afternoon again, uh, Lindquist, United Water Conservation District. And um, a few points. First of all, what a difference <laughs> these last couple of years have made. Um, 2012 to about 2022, so the, that 11-year period, we're in one of the worst droughts we've seen in our history here locally and throughout the Southwest, uh, to the point where there was a shortfall of about 25,000 acre feet available of surface water to PTP. And there's probably a shortfall available to PV also. I just haven't calculated that. So we ended up having to deliver them groundwater instead so that they continue their business out in the plain. That was a 10 or 11 year period again, 2012 to 2022. And then as pointed out in your um, most recent draft, I guess it was approved for submittal, uh, annual water year report for Oxnard and Pleasant Valley Basins, you could see that we recharged 100, 111,000 acre feet of water in 2023, which is about 50,000 acre feet more than we normally would have, so more than making up that 25,000 acre feet of loss. And then this year is already shaping up to be another wet year. We suspect, or anticipate actually, that by the end of this year, um, we'll be recharging on the order of 200,000 acre feet into the Four Bay, the Oxnard Plain, which is about uh, almost 100,000 acre feet more than we normally would. And some of that is due to new projects. So this isn't like just normal operations on the river. These are new projects that United's implemented, including the first phase of the construction of Freeman expansion and some of our state water purchases. And where I'm going with that, I guess, is that conjunctive use, coordinated use, whatever you want to call it, is hugely important here. And it doesn't work on five-year timescales, by the way. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the ordinance about five-year timescales. It doesn't work that way anymore. So I should step back just a second. And in calendar year 2023, we actually recharged a record volume of groundwater into the four bay, if you look at the calendar year rather than the water year. Um, Following the 11 year drought, which may have been the worst or is very close to the worst we've seen in our history. The point is with climate change forecasts predicting more of this, uh, they call it whiplash. I'm not too partial to that term, but we're expecting more droughts 
more super wet periods. Conjunctive use is even more important. It is going to be even more important in the future than it has been. So we need to make these programs as flexible as they can be. We need to make them work for people. At the same time, I'll just mention that overall groundwater extractions, or, or I'm sorry, overall water use, um, since 2000, about seven or eight in the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins is down about 20% today compared to back then. In fact, I just noticed that according to your report, and if you correct for the fact that there were some, some non-reporting, we probably had record low agricultural pumping in water year 2023 in, in the entire history that we are aware of, of pumping rates in the basin. And M and I, theirs is also very low. Overall, it's just amazing what we've done. So the basin is not in terrible shape this year. It's not going to be in terrible shape next year either. Because of all the water that's completely filled, the Santa Clara River basins, the Forbay and the Oxnard Plain are filling up rapidly. We're seeing artesian conditions along the coast. We're probably in really good shape well into 2025 right now. I know there's a court deadline for getting this resolved. So all that said, <clears throat> I'll say, I, I wanted to add that um, Oxnard has, this, um, has plans for overall decreasing use of state water project water in the long run. They've got their recycled water, at least that's the way I understand it. There's certainly opportunity for them to use less state water project in the future and not have to pump any more net groundwater from the basin because the, you're using ASR programs or, or credit programs, and also they have the opportunity to acquire more farmland and take those, uh, that allocation from the farmland on a one-to-one -one basis and use it. They won't need as much water per acre as the farmland they retire. So overall, a, a Cayegas um, flex use program, I don't see it or needing to require reduced um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't see them needing to be required to take um, state water project at the same level as they have in that period 2005 through 2014, the base period. In fact, I don't think any of the, well, I don't know about, uh, about Camarillo, but in the Oxnard Plain, I don't think Oxnard, for example, or Port Wayneme Water Agency are using as much state water project in the last four years as they did during that base period. So I, somehow we need to accommodate these long-term trends in use. They're using less water overall. They're using less Cayegas water. I don't, and then looking at the new proposed article 6.6.3, and I appreciate everything, the conversations we've had with your staff and, and your legal counsel. That's all good. But I don't see exact, I, I, I can't imagine how 6.6.3, for example, is one article or 6.6.2 actually works in practice. What does it mean that in any year in which a Cayegas operator does not make full use of the Cayegas water available to it, their extraction allocation shall be reduced by that amount? I, I, there's a lot of, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for interpretation there that isn't helpful. Um, and we've talked a lot today about theories, what's right, what's fair, but we haven't seen any examples of what this looks like if you map out the next couple of years, or maybe take the last few years as an example. How does this actually work? I can't figure this out, and I've managed to figure out the other flex allocations that were in the ordinance. I, I don't see, you know, there's a lot of uh, decisions that'll have to be made that I don't think are clear from the ordinance language as somebody else has brought up. So I see this as being a real challenge moving forward. Not that everybody isn't making their best effort. I believe they are. Um, ultimately, I. If there's a way to do it, that we could get more time, that we could get uh, Pleasant Valley County Water District, United, your staff, Oxnard staff, anybody else that's interested in taking advantage of a Cayegas allocation or a flex allocation, talk this through. Maybe work out some problems on a, uh, on a whiteboard or something. See how this is actually going to work, not just the theory, and get that settled and then go back to the court. I don't know whether that can fly. I, I'll bet if Oxnard agrees to it, the court would probably agree, but I, I'm, I'm a hydrogeologist. I'm no good at law. Um, but at, at the end of the day, really, as Jared mentioned, we need to encourage conjunctive use. Things are con changing in the climate. Things are changing in water use on the, on the Oxnard Plain, that yet the flexibility is still key. I think a lot of our old concepts that are based on this base period from 2005 to 2014, they, they're long gone and, and really need to 
be more thoughtful and, and like I said, do the math to figure out how this is going to work, how this, the, the proposed changes are going to work. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Chair West, we have a comment from Zoom. Excuse me? We have a comment from Zoom. Okay, please. Peter Candy. Uh, good afternoon, board members. This is Peter Candy. Let me know <clears throat> if you can't hear me for any reason. Um, I'm an attorney. I represent the Port Wainemi Water Agency and its two member agencies, the Channel Islands Beach District and the City of Port Wainemi. Uh, Port Wainemi Water Agency is a public agency that uh, has a contract in place with Cayagas and receives Cayagas uh, imported water. Um, We've been tracking the ordinance developments, and uh, it was not until uh, late in the day on Saturday that we actually saw any actual ordinance language that we had an opportunity to work with. I will say that uh, Mr. Kanger has been quite helpful and willing to talk any time that I've reached out to him, and I appreciate that. Um, but I will say that way, the way the ordinance is drafted currently, uh, these programs that are uh, supposed to uh, create more flexibility for uh, so-called Cayugas operators, um, uh, that flexibility uh, is not available to PHWA. Uh, the take provisions primarily um, put us in a position where we're going to need to look at the risk associated with uh, participating in uh, either one of these programs, uh, as well as the financial consequences. Uh, both of these issues have been mentioned and I won't reiterate them. I'm just uh, essentially echoing what you've heard previously. Uh, but I wanted to, to let the board know that, you know, uh, and I've discussed this with, with my client, uh, you know, the way we see this ordinance as currently drafted, it's not anything that we want to participate in. Uh, we were we were able to confirm that uh, the mandatory language, for instance, in the Cayugas uh, flex allocation program, uh, would not apply to us uh, uh, as long as we did not elect to participate in the program. Uh, we will not be electing to participate in the program as it's drafted, and. Um, uh, would encourage, to the extent there is any opportunity, to um, uh, uh, either delay uh, the ordinance amendments or uh, go back to the court and request more time to work on programs that actually uh, uh, encourage conjunctive use of uh, supplemental and groundwater. But we would very much encourage that and uh, would very much like to be a part of that program. But uh, if these ordinance amendments get adopted in their current form and remain on the books, uh, they're not anything that we can participate in. So um, appreciate your time and consideration. I just wanted to get that out there on the record. Thank you. Anyone else here in the boardroom? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess we will conclude the public hearing um, and return the discussion now to the board um, with respect to the ordinance. Um, I guess first and foremost, any questions of the board to council with respect to the proposed ordinance? Sure. Um, if I could, I'm understanding. So people did not get this red line version till 12 o'clock or till Saturday? Uh, till Saturday, yes. Okay, so is that our normal procedures or do well, we usually give them time? I'm just asking for validation. Our normal preference would be to get it out a week in advance, okay. but given the size of this particular agenda, this particular item, things got um, a little bit held up. We did publish it on uh, Friday evening, but for we had a technical glitch with the software that we used and the ordinance language was the one that was affected by that such that we weren't able to correct it until over the weekend. Okay, and then the baseline of the concepts that are in this red line, am I correct or in, not correct that we've been talking, we talked about this um, at the last meeting? Am I not correct on that? At, at the last meeting, the staff... Three, 
Well, the staff's proposal, staff's proposal included three options. Right. Um, one of which was re rescind the entire ordinance. The second of which was rescind just section six, or at least uh, the Conejo Creek provision and the Santa Clara River uh, flex provision. Um, your board directed us not to consider those seriously. Those remain an option um, in order to comply with the court's order. However, your board has indicated to wanted to pursue something else. The third option that was um, discussed at the February meeting is the Cayugas Flex program that you're seeing in here today. The proposed ordinance in here includes that Cayugas Flex program, but also adds a separate one um, that's modeled on the Conejo Creek provision that PV, PV currently receives and thus makes it available to other operators that can demonstrate um, that their um, use of supplement, their coordinated use of supplemental water during the base period resulted in either some, you know, some reduction in groundwater use below then allocation or the transfer of allocation from a management area to a non-management area. Okay, so then when we modeled this, did we talk with those groups to see if this would be a feasible thing? Yes, we spoke with, prior to coming up with this, we spoke with PV, United, and um, Cayugas, as well as Port Wyneme. Okay. And if this has to go, we have to go to court on April 1st, this is due? April 8th. April 8th. And so is there any, um, any um, flexibility, I'm just asking, if this was submitted, is there still flexibility to alter this ordinance at a later date? Not alter, amend. Absolutely. I mean, your board retains discretion to change uh, its ordinances at any time. Okay. We may be ordered by the court to do so <laughs> prior to you guys getting a chance to doing it, but you guys retain your discretion to amend your ordinances at any time. So if there is the willingness for your board to have a broader discussion about the provisions in this ordinance, whether as they current ex currently exist or may be adopted sometime today, your board has the discretion to um, and authority to revisit ordinances, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. If I could, I'd just like to make a couple comments real quick. The purpose of the OPV allocation ordinance is to establish allocations. That's the primary focus of Section 6 and, frankly, the larger ordinance. It's setting up allocations that will be used as the board transitions or the agency transitions from its then current management system, which was in place in 1819, but we're transitioning to now under Sigma. It's focused on allocations. Future projects, policies, programs that might otherwise encourage or incentivize conjunctive use are outside of the limited like purview of this exercise. You guys always have the discretion to entertain new projects, policies, procedures um, that encourage conjunctive use. For example, prior to picking up this particular issue with the city, your board adopted in October, I believe it was, the R an updated RWPA resolution which updated for the city's benefit those provisions that were otherwise limiting the uh, city's ability to extract groundwater that it had obtained a credit for. You guys are encouraging and incentivizing conjunctive use. This particular ordinance and the amendment that we're talking about here is just talking about conjunctive use as it relates to how allocations are set. So, future policies, programs, projects to encourage sustainable management or to get us on that track are still very much on the table. This ordinance doesn't restrict that, um, your authority to do projects, procedures, and policies in any way. So keep that in mind. Um, separately, I just wanted to respond to uh, Jared's comments. I, I appreciate, and I've mentioned this to you, that the Conejo Creek project has other contractual and um, legal requirements that governed it, and governed it prior to the adoption of the ordinance. Unfortunately, they didn't make their way into the ordinance. And so we have a 702 problem. And so the take requirement that uh, is in there is in, intended to provide parity amongst all the uh, operators that um, an adjusted allocation uh, is um, uh, being made available to. So uh, yes, there are, Jared's right, 
there are other agreements, there are other resolutions that govern how the Conejo Creek project is supposed to work. Unfortunately, they're just not in this ordinance. And so we've had to include, a, a, uh, we've had to amend the existing Conejo Creek provision a little bit to ensure that some of those um, requirements are in the ordinance um, and thus, uh, you know, are, are incorporated into our new adjusted allocation section. I think. Um, and then with respect to uh, Port Wainimi's comment, uh, I, they, they are a uniquely situated water user. Unfortunately, as it currently stands, they're not an operator. They don't operate a groundwater extraction facility under this ordinance. They, ha they have in the distant future, and they may, I'm sorry, in the distant past, they may have, and they may operate some, you know, um, they may have some wells on standby for emergency purposes. However, they do not exercise a groundwater extraction um, facility. They do not pump groundwater. They receive uh, groundwater from United via the OH pipeline. And that's recognized in the existing o um, OPV allocation ordinance as United holds in trust a sub-allocation for PHWA. So unfortunately, I, I appreciate Mr. Candy's comments and concerns. Unfortunately, they, they may not be able to take advantage of some of these programs but because it's they're, because of the way they uh, use and uh, because they use and uh, accept delivery of water. Um, it's not because of the way we drafted this ordinance. Um, in the future, if the OH pipeline agreement between PHWA and United is unwound for any reason, PHWA may start operating pumps. They may become an operator, and then they must be, or they may be entitled to take advantage of one of these provisions. That's all down the road and is somewhat speculative. It's hard to say exactly how those play, things will play out. Um, and just in final, I, I want to say that this ordinance, or the proposed ordinance that you guys have in front of you, is staff and council's best, or is a good faith best effort to comply with the court's order. As you can see, 702 creates a number of different issues, even if it, ha you know, even if it was well-meaning and intending to incentivize coordinated use of groundwater for the benefit of the basin. It's being interpreted in a way that really handcuffs the agency's options here. So does, it, does the proposed ordinance address every possible permutation. I can't say that we've actually analyzed it to such a degree, let alone how it might apply in the future, depending on how folks use their water. But for purposes of the base period, this, is, this proposed ordinance is staff and council's best good faith effort to prepare an ordinance that is equitable and, um, or, or, or avoids 702 violations and complies with the court's orders. So I'll leave it at that. Yes. Okay, so in my notes, I have some questions for you. Oh, okay. So the 6.2.1 um, that was uh, suggested with the comma and the Pleasant Valley and the other items. Yes. Any comments on that one? Um, yeah, I, I don't know that the change is necessary, and I'll explain why. Hold on, let me just get to the red line version. But is it hurtful to add it? It's redundant, and I'll explain why. So. I appreciate Mr. Mr. Or Jared's concern. Um, it's intent, or I think the intent in including it is to clarify that the obligation to take is um, arises when water is in fact made available. So when, if, for example, if Camarosa uh, or in the Conejo Creek project, you know, in let's say in a year they don't pr provide any water, there's no obligation for. Jared wants to clarify that there's no obligation by PV to take some other kind of water such that their um, allocation would be reduced. But if you look at the very first clause in that sentence, it says, in any year in which PV receives Conejo Creek project water. So it's clear that we're talking about years when water is available. And so the inclusion of the language that uh, Jared suggested to me seems redundant. But is it okay to add redundancy? I mean, it's... I, I, I know it's lawyer stuff in it, its it, particular. It, it, so I don't know that it has a legal effect. Right. Um, I, I so would it just, doesn't hurt. It, it, it doesn't have a legal consequence in my mind. I mean, okay. I'm just trying to think through it because the problem with this ordinance is, is that you pull a little here, it affects something over here, right? right. Um, think about it. I got another question for you. I don't, so let me just stand on the fact that I don't think that that is it doesn't hurt our position or the overall um, intent of this provision, so. Okay, thank you. The second one was the 6.4, which was the additional um, paperwork documentation. 
So is that needed in there? I think it is because we do want to be able to ensure that those folks or those operators that we grant an adjusted allocation uh -huh. to are in fact continuing to use in a coordinated way the supplemental surface water that they're um, that's being made available to them. So can we include those document that you've already called out before in there? Like, is there more detailed documents in uh, which it is? Just asking. I think that we want to leave it a little bit open-ended so that we can, we're not, rest, we're not restrained by the, the materials that we might otherwise suggest or request, but right? Doesn't the Caneo Creek uh, project ordinance already specify a litany of reporting and documents that PB has to provide? Correct. Can you call and those? Sorry. Is there some reason why this either needs to be supplemented? This seems kind of vague, where we, we already have a specific list and a specific history of compliance. This seems kind of vague in the face of that. But as it's written, remember that it's not just specific to PV. It's specific to other operators that might be um, that might obtain an increased allocation under the previous provision. So it's not specific to PV. PV requires, or you know, the PV resolution does require a certain amount of reporting, document, you know, availability. Annual meetings, all sorts of. Exactly right. That's not this provision isn't going that far. And yes, to the extent that the documentation required under that ordinance uh, or resolution would be somewhat applicable here, but it might be we might need something else from a differently situated operator such that we're at least, we at least have the authority here to ask for it. And, and again, I appreciate, Jared, your comments. Um, and, and then the other thing, no, I'll just, yeah. I understand the, I understand the specter of additional requirements, but um, it may be necessary to ensure that like there is compliance with the program. Thank you. And then the other question I had was, um, Cayugas had talked about the coordination, that uh, supplemental water, how do we coordinate? I, I'm sorry, I don't know that, I don't, I apologize, I don't remember the question specifically. It was, a, it was a baseline versus the number, like how are we coordinating when they've reached it and they have to get supplemental water and. Oh. Um, if I remember correctly, the, the provisions in the Santa Clara River Flex provisions are incorporated, the reporting requirements from the Santa Clara River Flex program have been carried forward into this new Cayugas Flex program, such that we should be able to receive certain documentation on the availability of surface water from those operators that are exercising a Cayugas Flex. We should at least be able to ask for the documentation that, in, that verifies their, um, the amount of supplemental water that they use during the, or the amount of Cayugas water that they use during the base period, but also um, whether they overpumped their extraction in any year, um, and thus the amount that they received per the take requirement in subsequent years. Okay, thank you. I have one last question. Um, this is a technical legal question that uh, I just need clarification on. So if the ordinance has changes made to it in the future, for whatever reasons they might be based on discussions with Oxnard and, and whomever else um, that are beneficial to the different parties. And those ordinances uh, changes are voted upon here by the agency. Do they have to go back to the court for approval? No, not necessarily. Once this case is, are you, are you suggesting that we resolve this case and then we want to make subsequent right. uh, changes and to the amendment? And those subsequent changes have to go back for further approval because no. of? No. One, once don't. the, like this, this proposed ordinance, if adopted, or some version of it, if adopted by your board, does have to go back because we're under an obligation. Right, right. right. But once, it, like, for example, if the court says, you did it well, you're fine, great, check that box, it's done. We have a new ordinance. Right, but further down the road, if there's any amendments that are made to it. No. But further amendments would be subject to court challenge, would be subject to challenge is what I'm saying, but they, would, they don't have to go back to the court. So, okay, just challenge. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jason. And, and let me also thank um, everyone that submitted both oral and written uh, comments and questions. Um, they really are appreciated, help crystallize some of the issues. Um, I, I can say after both studying the proposed changes as well as the order of the court and discussing it with 
county council and independent council, I, I'm satisfied that the changes, a, a couple of observations. One, I'm satisfied that the changes satisfy the court's order. They may not satisfy the need for good conjunctive use policy, but they satisfy the court's order. Um, at the same time, I don't necessarily think that the language is as clear as it should be. I think there are some areas where the um, uh, simple changes could, could better explain the purpose or the intent of uh, some of the provisions, particularly with respect to 6.6.2 and 6.6.3. Um, I, I understand why they're there. I understand how they work. I'm not so sure that my understanding is apparent in the reading of those sections, and I think, I think they could be clearer. And the same way with, with respect to, in those provisions where it talks to about available Cayugas water, I, I think available needs to be defined. It seems kind of silly, um, but, but uh, in theory at least, Cayugas water is always available and unlimited, which might render um, some of those provisions uh, difficult to apply. However, if available meant without surcharge, then it might better serve the purpose of those provisions and the, and the goal of that program. Uh, that's a drafting issue, and, and that goes to the nature of whether future changes would be beneficial. Um, but the, uh, the court essentially tasked us with a very specific uh, mandate and again, I, 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 although I think it's imperfect, I think these changes do satisfy that mandate. I guess if there are no, yes. Um, I agree. I am not happy that we were in court to have to decide this in the first time. But I do agree that uh, I think that's important for us to update any ordinances to make sure that they work for us. I mean, for me, it's case, put it through a case scenario and make sure it's operable and working and so forth. Um, so if this board is, is looking at doing that in the future, I think that would be something good what we do. Um, but it depends on when, time frame, and all that. Any thoughts? So if there are no other questions or comments from the board, then I guess, is there a motion to ad adopt the ordinance amendments as proposed and to find that the uh, amended ordinance is exempt from CEQA? In the interest of encouraging the discussion, I will make that motion. Is there a second? Um, I will second, but yeah. There's a motion and a second. We'll need a roll call. Chair West. Yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mohart. Sorry. Director Berger. Yes. Director Tremblay. No. No. Director Borchard. Reluctantly, yes, but I would qualify that answer that I would hope that we would come back to readdress some of these difficulties in this ordinance. But in the interest of meeting the court's deadline, I'm going to vote yes. Thank you. Let's move on then to can item. Can I ask one more question on that? Can, um, can I ask for this to be brought back to the, um, this board? afterwards and um, discuss any other changes we could do? 
Okay. You don't, I don't think you need a motion for that, correct? That's right, I don't think so. That's okay, right. because I think, I think that I, I hear everyone's comments here and I think that we definitely need to do that. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, let's move on then to item number six, a uh, presentation relating to the Oxnard Pleasant Valley Basin groundwater adjudication. Why don't we just wait one second while we switch out directors? Did we lose? Uh... You may not want to wait too long. <laughs> where, where did he go? <coughs> Maybe someone can grab him. Thank this, you. Actually, this next item isn't an action item. It's a presentation only. So, and and I'm and I'm sure we've all heard it before. So, correct. Um, go right ahead. Sure. This is an update on the um, Oxnard and Pleasant Valley groundwater adjudication. Um, uh, the, the OPV adjudication is a comprehensive groundwater adjudication. Um, it includes, amongst a number of other claims, a claim to determine all the water rights in the basin. Uh, the complaint was filed by the OPV coalition in June 2021. It was not filed by the GMA. Um, it's currently pending in the Santa Barbara Superior Court. Um, as I explained, the adjudication requests uh, a determination of all the groundwater rights in the basin. Um, this type of lawsuit is intended and specific to determining all the groundwater rights in a basin. Um, notice of the OPV adjudication and a form answer were sent out last year to property owners and water right claimants. And the reason this presentation is before you today is because the deadline to file that form answer and thus participate in the adjudication um, is April 1. It, the deadline has, there have been previous deadlines uh, set by the court starting back in August or July of last year. Those deadlines have been extended a number of times. It does not look like this April 1 deadline is going to change. So um, in order to participate and claim a water right in this adjudication, you need to file some kind of answer, including the, including the form, or not necessarily including, but um, you may file the form answer that was included with the notice um, that was mailed out to individual property owners and water right claimants. So, and the failure to file a form answer or any other kind of answer in this particular adjudication uh, may affect your water rights. For example, in the notice that was sent out to property owners and water right claimants, uh, these two, I'm sorry, these two, these two admonitions were included. Um, Failure to participate in this lawsuit could have a significant adverse effect on any right to pump or store groundwater that you may have. Failure to appear or file an answer by the deadline, which is the April 1 deadline, may result in your default and potentially the loss of your rights uh, to groundwater in the basin. So the failure to participate by filing a form answer could have some significant consequences for property owners and water right claimants. With this overview explanation in mind, GMA rec recommends that if, there, if any landowner or water right claimant has questions, that they consult their attorney immediately. The GMA is actually a defendant in this uh, adjudication um, and cannot provide legal advice. So, um, and then just in closing, uh, the notice does provide a web address for the OPV coalition and you can find out more information, or property owners and water right claimants can find out more information about the overall adjudication, as well as the OPV coalition on that website. Thank you, any questions or comments from the board on this returning item? Hearing none, any questions or comments from the public? None, thank you, let's move on then to item number seven. <laughs> board member appointments and committee assignments. I guess it falls to me then to Welcome the newest member of the board yet again, Director Trembley. Um, it's welcome anytime without a voice. So the, uh, uh, and the, but this is, um, uh, and the returning members, um, Director Long, Director Mulhot are returning to the board having been reappointed by their respective agencies. Um, I'm not sure whether to offer congratulations or condolences, but that's a, that's a common sentiment, I guess. Um, there, there's not enough time on the agenda <laughs> in this room to go through that debate. Okay, I guess with that then, it turns to uh, us to appoint a uh, board chair and vice chair for the coming year. 
Entertain any motions? Anybody wishes to make? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that uh, we appoint uh, Chair West uh, to continue being uh, chair. Unless you, do you want me to do this all at once or just? Yeah, why don't you do it all, let's do it all at once and see oh. if it flies. If not, then we'll do it. <laughs> That's fine. Why don't I uh, do it this way? Um, I'll mistake. nominate uh, Gene West to be chair and uh, Director Long to be vice chair. Any other nominations, either for chair or vice chair? Is there a second to the motion of Director Tremblay? I got nominated. <laughs> I'll second the motion. There's a motion and a second. We need a roll call. Chair West. Uh, now I know what Dave meant by reluctantly yes, but yeah, that's a yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mohart. Yes. Director Tremblay. Yes. Director Borcher. Yes. Uh, and I guess next it falls to us to, to uh, assign committee uh, memberships. Um, with respect to the uh, I guess the executive committee has already been decided. The fiscal and the operations committee. Any um, recommendations with regard to those committees? Isn't the executive, who's on the executive, executive committee right now? You and I. That's, That's what I thought. The, um, with respect to the fiscal committee and the operations committee, you know, I, I would motion that the committee membership remain the same, made up of the same representatives as previously assigned. So Unless operations is? Operations is, um, would be you and Lynn. <laughs> okay, and financial, just would, so that everyone hears it. Would be myself and Director Tremblay. So we have, we have one, we'd have one director that's not on a committee. So let's yeah, figure that at, one out. That's uh -huh. true, that's true. That's why I wanted it said out loud. So would, would how about? Both, both Dave and I have done all these committees. So I, I serve at the board's uh, pleasure. And if, uh, if you want Dave and well, I. Right, yeah, rather than overburden. On operations. Yeah, would that work? You wouldn't be on the operations, Dave? And yes, that sounds fabulous. <laughs> Got it set up, <laughs> running well. All right, so let me ask this. Is there a motion then that the operations committee shall be comprised of um, Director Mulhart and Director Borchard? I'll motion that. Is Sorry. there a second? Okay. Um, Borchard. I did. Oh, Tony did. Okay. So let's, let's go roll call on that one. Chair West. Yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mulhart. Yes. Director Tremblay. Yes. Director Borcher. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. And, right. and I guess, is there a motion that the fiscal committee would, I guess, then remain myself and Director Tremblay? I will motion that as well. And a second? And I'll, I'll uh, make a second. And a roll call? Chair West. Yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mulhart. Yes. Director Tremblay. Yes. Director Borcher. Yes. All right, thank you. Moving on. Um, Arnie, let me just ask on item number, since we have a director who has to leave, um, how long do you expect item eight to take? Uh, not, well, depending on questions, not very long. Uh, okay. It's just an update on the timeline, not very many technical details. Okay, let's, um, let's move on then to item number eight. An update on the uh, GSP five-year evaluation. Okay. Chair West, board members, Arnie Anselm, interim executive officer to the GMA. Uh, this is an update to the timeline of our five-year uh, GSP evaluations. <clears throat> uh, some background. 
Sigma requires that groundwater sustainability agencies evaluate their GSPs at least every five years. And the regula regulations re define what the scope of that evaluation is. <clears throat> Your board approved a contract with DUDEC uh, to include the five-year evaluation. And you've received a couple updates on that process uh, late last summer and fall. Uh, and DWR requires that GSPs, the actual GSPs, the plans be amended if the evaluation leads to changes uh, to projects or the overall management of the basin. <clears throat> We've held a stakeholder uh, workshop in August uh, here in this room. DUDEC presented, there was a question and answer uh, with them and GMA staff. Uh, that stakeholder workshop, the video is available, the question and answer audio is available, and the PowerPoint is available if anybody wants to uh, see what happened there. The next three workshops will be separate. There'll be um, separate meetings for the Las Posos Basin and the uh, Oxnard and Pleasant Valley Basins. Those topics are gonna to be the modeling results, and the reason we haven't had a workshop since last fall is we were waiting for the modeling results so there would be actual some real information to, to share. <clears throat> the, that we're hoping to have next month, or planning to have next month. Uh, the third workshop we're planning for October is going to be the, the meat of the five-year evaluation uh, for review and feedback. And then the fourth workshop, uh, we had to change directions on that one. That one is on the amendments to the GSP. When you amend a GSP, you have to have formal stakeholder process, including uh, a workshop. And again, separate workshops for uh, the Las Postas Basin and the Ox Oxnard Pleasant Valley Basins. Uh, it's a little difficult to read, but here's the timeline uh, of what we are doing and have done. Uh, the arrow at the top points out where we are now at the, at the end of March, beginning of April, and we're having the two workshops coming up next month. What I really want to point out down is at the bottom of the, of the uh, timetable there is we're going to have a final report available uh, before the last two workshops. So there's going to be something in, in the public's hands to, to look at, to discuss, and have um, good conversation at those two work workshops. Uh, finally, uh, your board will be asked to adopt or approve the five-year um, evaluation, and it is due to DWR in January of 2025. So we have uh, some time in front of us, but there's a lot of work to do. It is getting to be a compressed schedule, but uh, we will be on, we are on track. So, so can I, Arnie, my only, my, go back to the timeline. My only comment is, my, from my experience, if you have the GMA board adopts the report um, one month before the report is submitted, it gives no timeline for the GMA to hear public comments at the board level in a lot of ways, and for us uh, to make comments or corrections or the like. I would propose that you meet, you move the GMA board adopt report um, it's kind of hard because I'm proposing you move it in October, but you've got two different outreach meetings prior to getting to the GMA board, but you're turning around the next month in December, and <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not comfortable that there's enough time for the board to hear what people say, to weigh the different issues, give feedback, and finally, for staff to adjust those in the final report. Just, it seems like we're doing a hell of a job getting through the timeline, but when we get down to the punchline where we have to submit it and rule on it as a board member, um, that's a very narrow turnaround. That would, would concerns be, me. If I may, if, would it be helpful to bring uh, that item to your board, those two months, uh, update on the workshops as they are happening so the public can? speak to your board of what they learned I, at the workshops or concerns they have? I, I think anything like that that requires staff to present to the board in this forum what it had learned from the workshops and what you're going to do about those comments is bringing the board along and then maybe that timeline in fact will work because we're looking for staff to report that we heard this four months ago and here's our fix for it or it can't be fixed. I like that scenario much better than driving up to the cliff 
and telling me my, I hope the brakes work. Right. It's too close. Un understood. Wouldn't, wouldn't that also um, give us added points for stakeholder engagement for the GSP? Because they say you're supposed to be doing all these things and workshops and everything, so bringing it back here, because I know everyone's busy, and so they don't quite meet every workshop or night, you know what I mean? So yes. it would be one more added touch point. I, I, liked your, <laughs> I like your idea. Yeah, and, and on top of that, we have a public review uh, uh, bright blue bar that goes out in that last section, and there are touch points in every one of those where people can give feedback, except they can't give feedback if they get frustrated directly to the board. And I think giving feedback to the board is what our job is all about. So uh, that would be the modification I would put into this matrix. Okay, yeah, I will, I will add a, a board item modification here when we will bring this back. To, and we can make it a standing item for every meeting, whether we need it or not, and decide. Okay. So a little into the GSP evaluations, um, we're evaluating the ground, the, the groundwater mo modeling is a part of it. Uh, under the guidance, um, we're required to conduct modeling. Uh, DUDEC um, is, is, and United Water is conducting the modeling for the West Las Postas management area and the Oxnard, Pleasant, Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins. Uh, the modeling incorporates updates to the groundwater conditions. It's going to reflect these late, late, la late last two wet years. Uh, it's going to improve the understanding of the coastal aquifer hydrostratigraphy uh, and updated projects. Um, uh, uh, the modeling scenarios are going to be the baseline um, for future conditions with no new projects uh, and no management actions. There's a no projects scenario, which just evaluates the pumping reductions that would be required to achieve sustainable groundwater management. So that's, that's the steep cliff if, if our only tool is reductions in pumping. Uh, there's modeling of the projects without United's extraction brackish barrier project. And then there's modeling with the projects and the extraction uh, proposed extraction brackish barrier project. Uh, that last one is we're not modeling for the Las Postas Valley Basin because it does not apply out there. <clears throat> the projects that we're modeling uh, in the uh, Oxnard Pleasant Valley Basins include projects previously added to the GSP, projects selected through the annual project prioritization process that went through the operations committee, uh, um, but we could only include projects where there was sufficient detail to plug into the model so that the, and details that are presently known. Uh, those with not quite enough details, not quite refined uh, details or plans, uh, they're still identified in the GSP evaluations. <clears throat> in the Las Postas Valley Basin, the projects are those that identified in the adjudication judgment. <clears throat> so. During the evaluation, we're triggering some things that require the GSPs to be amended. Uh, DWR's implementation guidance requires those, these amendments. Uh, the amendments do require stakeholder engagement, and so that's why one of the workshops is now devoted to the GSP uh, amendments, and we'll bring that to your board as it goes along. So the recommendations for this item is feedback, um, and then to receive and file this presentation and just reiterating the planned workshops. Thank you, Arnie. One of the best suggestions to come out of the August workshop was uh, a suggestion that the, the workshop, mat the materials to be presented at the workshop be published in advance of the workshop so that um, interested parties can review the data, can review the, the PowerPoints and whatever other information there might be, and come to the workshop informed and, and ready to ask some meaningful questions. Um, that seemed to me to be a, a I, I know that adds a certain level of organization and preparation, but that certainly seems to be an important component in public outreach. I'd like to see you make that happen. Will do. Any other questions or comments from the board? I have a comment, Chair. Um, I just would remind staff, uh, and I've said this a number of times, but uh, the last paragraph I was reminded, we're going to be using groundwater modeling and these GSP evaluations. 
ultimately to revise our estimates of sustainable yield, minimum thresholds, measurable objectives. These are all those trigger points we've got in the GSPs that kind of indicate whether we need to change actions or not. A, a key part of that figuring of when we do that modeling is that amount of pumping that we found out occurred during the variance process that was not part of the GSP calculations and modeling back when we did them initially. It's a significant amount of pumping that came out of the woodwork during that variance process that should be added in when we're doing this new modeling because I think it significantly will change those thresholds. I can't speak to the change that uh, we're discovering, but yeah, that, that is what's required under DWR is to include all that new information uh, when these five-year evaluations happen. So it is being included. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? If there aren't any questions or comments from the public on this item. All right. We'll, this no action just to receive and file. We'll move on then to item number nine. Uh, John Flynn Groundwater Stewardship Award. We need two volunteers from the board. <laughs> let's see. And um, let's see. Last year, the two volunteers were Director Perillo and Director Mulhart. So I think you're exempt this year, Lynn. I haven't, uh, <laughs> I haven't done it in a while. I'll, I'll volunteer. All right. We have one. Is there a second volunteer? That's, I, I don't. Is that volunteering? <laughs> I didn't think that qualified you, that you're the rookie. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that disqualifies you at all. You've been all here right, before. All right, I'll do it. All right, we have two volunteers. Any objections to a, the committee being comprised of Director Tremblay and Director Borchard? All right, there's your committee. Thank you. Move on now to item number 10. <coughs> ah, okay, that's me. All right, can you pull up that? All right, item number 10 is uh, basically the report of the executive committee some of the, concerning some of the ongoing um, work discussions that have been um, uh, related to uh, staffing the agency into the future. The, um, since our meeting of, um, and you can forward, you can go to the next slide. Since our meeting of December 1st, there have been ongoing discussions on the part of the committee with, with stakeholders, with staff, with um, consultants, uh, some, some staffing augmentation consultants, as well as with uh, the, um, uh, some county personnel. And uh, three different staffing models have sort of bubbled to the surface. And by all means, and I'm going to present those. And I don't mean them to be exclusive. They're just the ones that seem the most prominent. Um, and I, I, at the outset, want to thank everybody that's contributed to the discussions um, and don't by any means intend that these three models to be exclusive. They're just simply the ones that have been the most prominent and we're certainly happy to explore any other ideas. Um, I also want to, at this point, publicly thank the county CEO, uh, Dr. Savette Johnson. Um, I've been meeting with her regularly. She's been very helpful, very enthusiastic in her support for some of the concepts and offered some really good suggestions. And um, she's been a valuable resource, and I want to acknowledge that and thank her for it. So we're going to discuss basically, and this isn't, we're not at a decision point, um, and that's not what this is intended. But I want to just inform the board of where we are and then make a suggestion about how we proceed. Uh, and the two items to cover, one that mentioned those three different staffing models, and to, then some of the characteristics common to each of these models that are maybe a little bit different than the way we've been operating to date. Let me go to the next slide. All right, so those those. Basically, and I, and I try to keep these things short, one of the things that, that uh, came out of that December 1st meeting upon which everyone agreed, uh, including the stakeholders who spoke, uh, the former executive officer, the current executive officer, um, and um, basically, and, and the county CEO, is that the agency needs dedicated staffing, not staff shared with other departments, whether they're county departments or anybody else, any dedicated staffing, dedicated to work of the agency. 
And in each of these models, the executive officer and the assistant executive officer positions are either direct hires or indirect hires by this board. Not hired by, not directly hired by anybody else. Whether they're employees of of another agency, whether it's the county or United, that's a different question. But they're directly hired by and answerable to this board and this board only. Uh, the third item that's common is that those positions, the executive officer and assistant executive officer, will be of a limited term. Uh, for example, and that this was something that was discussed with the county CEO, she serves uh, subject to a, a three-year contract. And the Board of Supervisors can extend that term, they can renew the term, um, but there's a limited term which I think the, the premise is that it tends to, to improve accountability and transparency. So that's built into each of these concepts as well. In each of them, the levels of staffing and the type of staffing for the other positions uh, are decided by the executive officer, the assistant executive officer, and the board. Um, levels of staffing being, you know, what people they need to do what jobs um, and uh, whether those people are full-time or part-time. Those are, you know, those are decisions that the, the executive officer and assistant executive officer would bring to the board and, and to, you know, make those determined determinations with the board. In terms of the types of staffing, the reason that's there, one of the things that's become uh, prominent in, in uh, my discussions with uh, the county CEO is that there are options beyond just simply hiring staff. You know, then uh, principally, I mean, the county in some of their operations uses a great number of contract staff. And, and I know um, uh, the executive, the, the Interim executive officer and I have both been in contact with staffing augmentation agencies, some of which specifically provide services for a GSPs, a GSAs, and watermasters. Um, and uh, they have a variety of different companies have better different specializations, and they have a variety of contract level uh, employees that can be used. Which and and I know from the, the county's experience that. Often those contract employees are, um, uh, have, have greater longevity than sometimes direct hires and often can come uh, less expensively. So those are, that's, they're built in, that analysis kind of built into the different models. Uh, as I mentioned, all of the staff, whether they're direct hire, indirect hire, or contract personnel, are managed and directed exclusively by the agency um, and, and this board. And um, among the other things that have been discussed is that, you know, it's the, the, the purpose of this is to develop, you know, an agency that, that is as independent as it can be. Uh, and that may, at the discretion of the board, but these models may include as well agency staff staffed in an agency office. If we're no longer using borrowed part-time county staff to fill different roles, there's no reason for the agency to be warehoused in this complex. And, and you know, the premise is to both act and appear independent. Separate offices might serve that. That's potentially built into these models as well. I want to go to the next slide. The three models, fairly simple. One is you know, independent direct staffing. That's where the agents we essentially stand up an independent agency uh, that hires its own personnel. And whether those employ, whether the, 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 certainly the executive officer and assistant executive officer would be direct hire employees of the agency exclusively, and then the rest of the staffing may be direct hires, may be contract staff. That would depend upon the consultations that I mentioned earlier. That's certainly one option. Um, the second option you see there listed is the hybrid indirect staffing. Uh, and that's basically where the executive officer and the assistant executive officer would be uh, either I say, I say hybrid indirect because they may be employees of the county, 
They may be employees of United, but they're hired by this board to be employees of the, you know, for example, if it's a county employee, he may be on the county's payroll, but we're hiring him and he works exclusively for this agency, not subject to supervision or control by any other county department, is answerable only to the CEO's office. Um, that would be, an, an, and again, and, and the, the subordinate staff, the other positions would be subject to um, what this board decides in consultation with the executive officer and assistant executive officer. And the third option listed is staffing entirely by consultants and contractors. As I mentioned, there are staffing augmentation agencies that specialize in the work that we do and who have personnel, uh, some of them senior, some of them less so, who have executive experience, who have engineering and hydro-engineering hydro experience, uh, as well as administrative staffs. And one of the options might be that instead of having either direct hire or indirect hire personnel, we essentially outsource uh, all of those positions um, to serve the, the functions of the agency. We we'll go to the next slide, if you will. Basically, um, there are there are challenges and questions and issues with each of these various options, not the least of which, though, is, is what will these options cost? And so the part of the, the two reasons for this update, one is to update the board and certainly to ask for any ideas anybody has. Uh, we don't profess <coughs> to have... <laughs> any good ideas, we just have ideas. So I'm happy to hear whatever good ideas anybody might have, but authorized to ask uh, the board to authorize the executive committee to retain a consultant to perform a comparative cost analysis with respect to these various staffing models. You know, which uh, some of the, you know, one, of the, one or more of these models may get eliminated as soon as we see what the costs are. Um, you know, for example, and I don't know this, but if we outsource 100% of the uh, work of the board, that might be much more expensive than the other options, or it might be much less expensive, but I'd be guessing if I told you either was correct. Um, and, and that's basically what we wanna do. Okay, we, we've narrowed some options, we've looked at some structure, and so what is it going, before we, make a, before we come back to the board with a recommendation or ask the board to consider any options, we thought one of the pieces of information the board would wanna have and the public would wanna have is, is what are the cost implications of any changes that the board might consider. And so that's the, that's the request here. So, that's, yeah. so I, first of all, thank you, because I think this has been a great outline of some thought that's put into it. One of the items that's not up on board action, and I would call it number three is, and that is what is our estimated timeline for when we think we would want to go to a selected model? Has any thought been given to that? And you don't, you don't have to answer it now, but okay. I think we need to have that up there. And the reason I think we need to have that up there is because, um, I need I need to take this these concepts back to the uh, essentially the entity that appointed me and have a discussion with that entity and see how much uh, input they would have in which drives the amount of flexibility that I would have or whoever is representing United at the time gives us a chance to think about it because I think within the three models, <clears throat> three that you outlined, and you said it correctly when you started, that these are just a first blush at it. Out of that discussion with, with uh, the, the folks at United, we may come up with a hybrid of the hybrid, right? So before I would agree to doing a comparative cost analysis, I think we need to take your first suggestion, and that is, this is a starting point, and have each of us go back to our respective constituent base and have that discussion of what do they expect from this agency and what do they think based on these initial three models, um, and maybe out of that we'll come back and we'll have a little bit broader base. Because I think we need to go through that exercise then to race to a decision and find out, oops, 
we, we move too quickly. <coughs> to, to address some of your concerns, um, I have met with, with uh, Mauricio, with, with United's general manager, and in fact, not only discussed these options with him, but he actually was a source of referral for some of the staffing augmentation folks that we've reached out to. Um, so I mean, in, in terms of the, there's been an ongoing outreach since that December 1st meeting that is, that's included uh, stakeholders, it's included United, it's included- And, and I, I absolutely agree that that was a, you know, a, the correct thing to do. But my comment then would be, I have not heard this discussion come up at board level, and we need to have that meeting at the board level with Mauricio uh, so that other board members can participate in that process. So my, my comments of, of, of sorting out the three general ideas and fine-tuning that, I, I, I would ask for that time and that's why I said we need to come up with number three. I don't want this to take four years to come up with this answer, and I don't expect to have an answer in two meetings. I think that would be too fast. And then once we boil it down to realistically what the three or four models will be after these internal discussions with our respective agencies, then I think we need to do a comparative cost test and that would be the appropriate time so that it's actually more definitive what we're actually suggesting. Couldn't you do that now and provide this presentation to them and at least give them a heads up as to the diff three different items? I'm the first hearing this too, so I'm gonna go back and talk to you. Except the, prob CEO. the problem with that is we're gonna spend money and we don't really know if I, I can't tell you today that all three models were yeah. rejected. So why are we spending money on three that are rejected? What if we spend, uh, what if we come out of those three and we hybrid and wind up with three hybrids of those three and those are the models we have. I mean, it's, it's almost like saying, um, let's do a, a cost analysis on a, on a bunch of cars and I don't know what my wife is willing to drive. I want to make sure that she has an opportunity to pick whatever she drives and then I can argue with her, we can or cannot afford it. And so I don't want to put the chicken, uh, whatever the saying is, chicken, bef the, the eggs before the, I don't know. Cart know. before the horse. Cart yeah. before, there you go. <laughs> the I, think, I think you, we have to do a comparative cost analysis. Clearly we have to do that. But I do believe that under considering other staffing models is the question you're asking. And I think that's the first question we need to ask. Are there, are there variations or other models we haven't thought about? And I think we need to deal with that one first. One of my concerns is in fact the timeliness issue that you mentioned. Um, you know, as of, it may have, if things have changed in the last 10 days, Arnie will tell me, but as of 10 days ago, eight of the 12 positions that staffed this agency were vacant. I don't think we can wait mm. to figure out how we're gonna deal with this. I, I think there are ways to do that analysis that will give us the information we need to then hybridize things further and and based on that project costs. Um, the, um, because we can, in doing the analysis, we can look at, you know, what is a, what does a direct hire staff look at, look like? What does that hybrid model look like? What does contract staff look like? And then it's just taking pieces and moving them on the chessboard to, and, and totaling them. I, I think that's doable and, and that would avoid the being in the position three months from now, six months from now, it's, this is gonna take a while no matter which approach we take, but, it's, but we don't have an unlimited amount of time and we've been told that already. Well, so. that's again, that speaks to why I said number three ought to be some, and, and you've now raised a different issue that we did not know about until you spoke to that issue, that we have this, this staffing issue right now. So are we looking to, on this particular item are we looking at a one month turnaround, a two month turnaround? Does it need to be faster than that? I need to have some sense of time so that when I bring it 
bring this issue up to uh, at the board level that I have, I can frame it, say, look, guys, I, we, we cannot debate this for the next seven months. We need to answer some questions because of the nature of the problem. It was my contemplation in bringing this that in a perfect world, the work would be done within 60 days. Okay, that's the timeline. I haven't spoken to any of the consultants to ask them how long it would take them to do it, but that was, that was simply my own conception. That's all. All right, well, that at least gives us a starting point. 60 days to make a decision. It'll take some time to staff up based on whatever that decision well, no, no, it was 60 days to complete the work. Oh, okay. Not to make a decision, but to complete the work. Ah. So, again, that pretty, was just my own imagination. Pretty, that's so, pretty rapid. So we've had a lot of discussions at this board and throughout the community calling people and doing stuff. So these three different line items is uh, seeing what we have to our scale of work to do and look at what each one would be an estimate. It's not a, this is a budget, we're mm -hmm. hitting it. It's so indirect is gonna cost us a million and consultants will cost us three and direct will cost us a million five, who knows? but so that we have some avenue to look at, at which ways we're more interested in what looking at. Because we have a letter from two different lawyers <laughs> that say two different things. One is that a director of this, this board has to be from United in the county. And then one that says you may and you can use whoever you want. So, um, I just throw that in there as well, but it also is a cost. And to me, I look at it as, are our staff gonna perform and do the work that we need them to do? And is it at a cost that is not gonna put agriculture or anyone else out of business? I think it needs to be something that we all are agreeing on because I don't think we want rates to increase. Well, everyone would love rates to decrease. So I think knowing a cost would be really important. That's how I'm looking at it. Yeah, that was one of the things we heard, if you remember back on December 1st, everybody had preferences, and then when asked, you know, when you factor cost into yeah. it, it was, well, I gotta know what the cost is before, and that's just, this is just the extension of that. I, I'm not trying to hold up this process for a cost. You're you, now in the discussion, you're raising different parameters, you know. We have a range. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know where it's gonna fall. We know how much money we have. We know when the funds come in. Uh, but we have to go through a public process to do this. We're not going to spring it on anybody. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a number of moving targets simultaneously. And um, so the second, so consideration of other staffing models can be solved by us speaking to our respective agencies. And it may be that we come right back to where we are right now, which is fine. Mm -hmm. And then the second ask is authorize the executive committee to retain a consultant to perform a, an, and I would add the word initial, uh, well, comparative cost analysis. Uh, if you follow these three models, I'm okay with that. And the third thing I asked for, and we've kind of gotten it, is that we have a fairly quick turnaround for, for practical and staffing issues. Otherwise, we're going to get so far behind, it, we're going to have to dig ourselves out of a hole. So I think we've, an in my opinion, for me, I, we've answered all three of these questions. And the second one, um, I, I understand your, your position that we could do that simultaneously by doing these other two items that I just talked about, and I'm okay with that. But and I you, like your idea of add an initial. Initial, <laughs> yeah. This is a preliminary, or perform a preliminary, some other qualifying word to make sure people understand that we didn't. We're at the start. We're at the start. We're not at the end. Yeah, because this is the first time I've heard of, of yeah. I've seen this presentation, just so you know. I, yeah, first time I've seen this too, yeah. I think for all of us. You know, if I could add some color a little bit. The executive Committee's been working pretty actively on this and trying to get this problem solved. And, um, but we also were wanting to really demonstrate to the board and the stakeholders that this was a deliberate process and, and it, it had logic to it and we're marching in a, in a, in a logical fashion. And I think that's been demonstrated now. Um, the other thing that we had we had kind of thought or hoped in this uh, cost analysis is that the consultant would likely, because the consultants I think were considering, do this work. They do this GSA and water master work. 
might have suggestions about what they've seen in other agencies and what those agencies cost. <coughs> and the, the only thing we know here is what we've done since 1985. We've really not had a cost comparison. And so that's another part of this process that I think is actually really critical for the stakeholders in, in bringing together a, an, an agency that I think is as, efficiency, as efficient as possible and, and, and accomplishing the work in a, in a timely fashion. And that's, and that's been a problem, frankly. I'm a little disappointed I won't be able to continue that effort, but I trust that Director Long's gonna do a great job as well, so no worries. So uh, where do you wanna go on this item? Do we wanna hear from the public? No, no, or no, no, Director Mahler. And no, we have to hear from the public too. Okay. So um, one of the advantages or disadvantages, as you will, of coming out of the board as of March 1 is I had a chance to go back and look at the prior meetings and so this board uh, in its December meeting and you you all will recall this sheet that showed the uh, VC uh, Fox Canyon GMA work tasks and prioritization and I'm mindful director Mulhart that you indicated uh, for all those that were um, labeled urgent uh, they were not all equal in magnitude however that said there were ver some very specific things that have to be done, and they have to be done in short order. You know, for example, uh, Ventura Water had submitted a letter to this board as of December expressing its real concern uh, that the GMA isn't adequately staffed to do what we need to get done. Uh, Chair, you just indicated we have eight out of 12 positions vacant. So I think there's a, I think, uh, what I would suggest, and, and, and by the way, since December, that situation has only been exacerbated, right? Because we've lost uh, our executive officer, no disrespect to our interim executive officer, just we keep bleeding people. What I think we have to add to this is a very, uh, and I would add it as number three, I would like to know from the interim executive officer at the next regular meeting, if that's possible. And it, this can be done in conjunction with, with what you're proposing here, Chair, um, to follow up on what was done in December in terms of the prioritization and to give us, to revisit that list and to provide us with, for each category on this list, they're divided into seven Roman numerals, board meetings, legislation, regulations, judgment and litigation, ordinance, resolution, et cetera. For each of those categories, how many personnel are needed? What are the FTEs? Regardless of whether they're hybrid or consultants or whatever, I wanna know how many bodies we need to accomplish each task. And I'd like a roadmap, I propose that we have a roadmap for the next nine months out to the end of this calendar year saying, this is how we are going to accomplish these tasks. Or conversely, if we can't accomplish it, then we will know that. But I think we have to have that within the context of doing a comparative cost analysis of staffing models. I wanna keep our eye on the ball for the priority things that this board needs to accomplish. Because right now we've got so much out there that is not getting done through no fault of staff. I mean, staff's working really hard. I, I really applaud them. But when you don't have the sufficient number of bodies to throw, at tasks, you can't get stuff done. And I want to get stuff done. So I would ask the board to add an item uh, along the lines of what I just articulated, uh, which is to take what was done in December for the work tasks and prioritization, and at the next regular meeting, come back to this board with a report on what needs to be done in the short term over the next and I, I'm saying it out to the calendar year. Chair, with, with all respect, I, I, I hear what you're saying. What I heard you say, what, I, what I'm walking away with is it's 60 days from retention, a consultant could, could accomplish the work. But you've got a period of time to that retention, and then you've got a period of time to, for preparation of a report, and you've got a period of time to come back to this board. Realistically, that ain't going to happen until fall. Oh. Oh, realistically, I... Don't think it would happen until, well, all right, I'll amend that. You're I'll work for me, have you? I'll walk it, but I'll walk, but I'll walk it back. But the bottom line is, 
I don't want to be running adrift for the next, I agree. For the next six months to nine months. I want to know who's doing what, where. And, I, and so I would ask that we amend this to require uh, our interim executive officer to come back with those tasks. That's a good idea. I know Arnie has been working very hard on oh, the yes. staffing issues. He's been consulting with <laughs> people I've referred to, to people <coughs> he's identified on his own, uh, trying to fill those holes. Indeed, that list of uh, tasks and priorities that we worked on in December becomes sort of um, chapter one in identifying what the staffing needs are based on the tasks that need to be performed. All of all of those things will factor into the comparative, the initial comparative cost analysis. But as far right. separate from the cost analysis is the, your question in terms of how do we accomplish those tasks? I, I think that's a that's a good point, a good idea. Arnie, is that something we can have at the next meeting? Yes, I'll have something for you. We can do that. Yeah. That's right, and 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 that's great, Arnie, and thank you for for doing that. Um, you know, and with respect to you know reasonable minds differing on 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 Section 408 of our Special Act, uh, lawyers, of course, are always reasonable. So we can always reasonably differ on things, right? But that's a separate issue mm -hmm. from having staff sufficient to accomplish what the agency needs to get done. And so it's a, and and that's what I'm focusing on here, rather than focusing on, gee, what does 408 we'll allow to us? So let me, let me do this. Let me then, I know you have to leave soon. Let me ask the public if there's any questions or comments from the public on, on this executive committee report. <coughs> Hello, Chair Brooke Perolo, uh, alternate member for the MNI. <clears throat> With respect to this, I appreciate the discussion, but I would like to remind the board, in my opinion, in my opinion as a member who sat up there for a few years, one of the issues that happens to our agency executive sec uh, officer is he's held between the public and he's held between the board. And I've asked in the past and I never got a second, never got any follow through with respect to holding some sort of a resolution. Since 1982, there's never been ability to hold the executive officer accountable. You're asking the executive officer now, the interim, to do something. And if he doesn't do it, who's he accountable to? I wish him the very best of luck, and I, it's, they're almost giving you like an impossible task here. Um, but that's a mistake on the board. The board should hold him accountable. I've had opportunities to talk to the current Mr. Trembley about this, and we talked in your office in Camarillo, and I've talked to the CEO of the county before when she uh, had come down to this body and the county council. Different agencies, when they have somebody working for them, they have the ability to hold them accountable so that everybody knows what's going on and that individual knows where they stand in the view of everybody that they're working for. So I hope that you will consider putting it in there because it's an impossible task to ask somebody to do a job, but he's not really accountable to you, but he's catching hell from the other side, the people that are paying the bills here. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Hi, uh, Maureen McGuire with the Farm Bureau of Ventura County. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for really taking the concerns of your stakeholders seriously and especially the executive committee for all the time that you took to deeply think about these options. Uh, I am uh, really excited to look at this democratic process in play and it gives me some faith. I have the honor of working with lots of different boards and this is one of the most transparent, easiest to work with and um, you know you definitely have an ear to the users and I really appreciate that and it's shown in the work that you've done here. Um, so thank you. Second, I wanted to just note, um, Chair West, you said you know, we were really looking at something that's independent. And I wanted to reiterate that. That was one of the primary concerns that we elevated in our letter to the board about the GMA um, staffing considerations. And I also wanted to make sure that you include the scope that you talk with your, um, your uh, contractor to 
really think about what is the work that needs to be done and how might that be accomplished. One of our main issues is the accuracy and timeliness of reporting. And I know that the current staffing model has been chronically understaffed. And so making sure that that consultant understands it's not about returning to the status quo, but about making sure that um, the resources are appropriate to the kind of scope that you guys are uh, overseeing. And I was encouraged when you said you're going to have working with a consultant who has awareness of other um, GSAs and other similar agencies who can say this is what staffing levels typically look like. I'd also encourage you to include in that scope uh, a dedication to stakeholder engagement. That was another thing that we elevated. And to that end, I would love to have the opportunity for at least one meeting. Um, it would be great if it's a, a group meeting with the consultant to elevate and clarify any um, positions that we put forward in our letter or any of the other kind of stakeholder comments that have been brought forward so that the scope that they are uh, putting a comparative cost to is actually reflective of uh, the needs of the organization. So just wanted to come up and say thank you, and then also to uh, share that uh, the Farm Bureau would love to be a part of this process in any way that would be helpful to you in your decision making. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's hell getting old. <laughs> uh, I, my, I'm Michael Kelly. I was on this board for some years, and in Jack, Fury, the, 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 when Jeff went on, uh, uh, came aboard, that was about the period where I got on the on this board, uh, and then now he retired. And I'm getting pretty tired. So <laughs> that's how. And I think uh, I think I, I thank Eugene for taking my place mm -hmm. because that at this point in my medical year, I I would have a hell of a time walking around here. So so anyway, uh, number one thing I would like to say to you guys, uh, all of you, uh, is that it's nice to have the discussion you're having. And the input from each of you has been really knowledgeable and, and I think a, a good for it to happen. Um, the, the ag community, at least, I'm quite aware of. I, I, you know, I was a veterinarian for uh, too darn long, and, but now I'm primarily a farmer and I uh, have been for the last 40 years, too. But uh, I, I have to tell you that this agency is a state agency. This is not a county agency. And I, the damn county was a stumbling block <coughs> because you couldn't do something unless it honored Jeff. And I think the best thing was the his his walking out, uh, but anyway, um, the 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 Ms. Kelly, I uh, I re last thing I remember with you, you were over in the Wheeler Canyon, and I you were worrying about getting elected, and I'd already put my ear to the ground. You were going to win, and you did, and you have, and I really think you've done it. A, a nice job of doing it. And it's such a relief to get rid of Steve Bennett. But um, <laughs> there you have it. Um, I, I, I really kind of gave up because I realized that by my second time, and that's why I was glad that Gene take his place, uh, I wasn't going to get this out of here. My wish was we would pick this thing up and carry it someplace else. To that, we put a new uh, program at that time. Maybe you've got a new one now different than that. 
but we had a U, uh, computer program being made, and I demanded it be written in, and you can go to the, in, the uh, t uh, hearings, and, I mean uh, the tape and find it, but I had written in that thing because they wanted to do it through the county uh, uh, personnel code or a guy. Well, I said, you got to make the damn thing so if we move it out of here, it'll still work. And that was how I felt about this. Um, but I, I wish, I, I really wish you do not take your second thing and make it a, uh, a, a hybrid because it, there were too many impotent people. There were people there had to have their little feet in each thing. And in the end, they had to go up and be kissing Jeff's what and so um, I, 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 I beg you to think about getting your new staff having them work for you when they, when they when you borrow stuff from the county you don't get to tell them how good they are they can be crappy but they get their report from the boss who's in the stew uh, and one level or two levels low, below the, the board of supervisor person, unless that person is a, is a busybody. And I don't think there, you, no one could meet the, the, the great at which Steve Bennett could pull that one. Uh, but um, anyway, I think that, that what I hear today is great. I, I was hoping we would move this out and get away. I think the county right now in the water business would be a lot further along and a lot less agitated had we not had the county public works standing over us like a menace and if we could have gotten us out of here. I do not know because I'm not working here with you all every day, but I think that had we not had so much influence by the county public works, we would have been way off, better deal. I had too many in the farm community come to me and complain and complain and complain and threaten to do a lawsuit and all the other things that you could wink up. And it was finally just too damn much to uh, uh, lead the troops to try to get you out of here. But I do wish you will get out of here. To that wish, I, what I've seen today, to, you, is a very good group that you've got now. I would love to be back on it just to see how good, because I, I think there's still a lot of good territory that can be done. And I have, I, I know some of the people who were like the attorney that was in when they um, made the law in Sacramento, uh, you know, trying to get the thing cut. But they were working and taking a lot of ideas from what we were doing here and, and, and made it into a state law. Uh, they, 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 those, some of those people are still available. But don't go up stairs and get somebody who's going to step on your every bit. With that, I would like to tell you thank you. I thank all of you. Thank you, Michael. My name is Ian Prichard. I'm going to try to follow that comment. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, I actually have two comments. First one from Cayugas Municipal Water District, um, so I've got that hat on. Uh, the Cayugas Board discussed this at length recently, um, but at, at this point, uh, as several people mentioned earlier, want to see a financial analysis before I take too strong a position on one path or another. Um, but just to reiterate comments that I've made on Cayugas' behalf before, that it seems, it seems very pertinent and important that this board have direct oversight over its executive officer, which clearly comports with Gene, the slide that you showed earlier. And then we would also encourage you to, to as important as it is, I've heard you all say that 
I want to get this done, but to take your time with the financial and the pro-con analysis. Um, because independence certainly has some value, but whether that's enough to make up for what appear to us to be obvious and significant efficiencies of certain aspects of county support is a complicated question. Right? It's going to take time and, and data to, to solve. Um, that's my Cayugas, Cayugas comments. Uh, in my other capacity today as the chair of the Las Posas Basin Water Master Policy Advisory Committee, uh, submitted a letter reflecting the PACS perspective, which is a little bit more developed because we had the opportunity to engage with Chair West and with Director Borchard at a couple different PAC meetings. So hopefully you've all got the letter and there's just two things I would want to point out in that letter to uh, offer as part of the conversation that I, I haven't seen reflected because most of it has been reflected, Gene, in what you put forward. One that um, the PAC recommends you hire not just independent executive officer, but independent counsel as well. And the idea that we batted around was that those two individuals in conjunction with your board would then figure out the optimal staffing. Uh, and that includes financial and cost benefit analysis of a number of different um, possibilities that, would, that could come up. But as you know, the executive officer could be one of these individuals or firm that has significant experience with water masters and groundwater management agencies across the state. And then the second one is just that because as, as Director Trembley mentioned, this could be a long lead item. And it, um, that in the meantime, that you direct the, ex the interim executive officer, which I understand he's doing to some extent already, but to do exactly what Director Trembley said, is identify those priority critical issues and find folks that you can hire by next Tuesday to get those things done. And from the PAC's perspective, critical on that priority issue on that critical items list is an analyzing and comparing the GMA budget and the water master budget and understanding if there is any overlap between those budgets, where, they, where that overlap is, so that the water master can figure out what the second assessment for this fiscal year is and what the budget should be going forward. Happy to take questions on either hat. Thank you, Ian. Sherry Klima with the city of Oxnard. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to wait on commenting on this until we hear a little bit more. I have, I have um, something tangential maybe to offer to this conversation, which is I've worked with city staff either as an attorney or a city manager in some capacity for 15 years. I've never been on a city council. I've never been on a county board of supervisors. I've never sat where you all have sat. And in 15 years, I have never been told or seen another staff executive group been told to give the set of priorities to the board sitting up there. It's always the opposite direction from where I've sat. It's the board that gives the priorities of the agency and the staff that executes those priorities. In my experience, it may be that you want to run this board differently, but I've never seen a board run like this before. And I do believe that that's part of the problem in what has happened here. And it, it comes from both directions, right? You've had, frankly, I can't say it as well as one of the prior speakers has had the comments on your agency director, but you've had an agency director who has called all the shots and told you all the priorities of this agency. And that is a lot of the frustration that I've heard from the public both today and on December 1st is that your director, your executive director has run this board. But the counter to that is that uh, from where you all sit, you need to give the priorities to that staff. And it needs to be a dialogue back and forth. In our city, our city manager, our staff presents 
In, in our case, we had a five-year set of strategic priorities. We presented what we thought was the best set of options to the board and the board member, and the city council rather, and the city council then said, no, you're wrong. Here's what you're gonna do. And they told us the priorities. And then we execute what they say. It's not the opposite. And so I would suggest to you that it's not a problem to have your exec interim executive director tell you what's in the queue right now. But going forward, um, you all need to tell your staff, direct your staff as to what your priorities are. Um, I think that's relevant for whoever your next executive director is. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Or hearing none, then returning to the board, the, the request is for um, the, this board to authorize the executive committee to retain a consultant to perform an initial comparative cost analysis of the staffing models. Is there a motion? Can I ask one more question on that? Or do you want to go first, Lynn? I'll make that. Okay. Um, I did like the suggestion of including the scope of work. I'm sorry. I, including the scope of work. So along should, with the, having that so that our public also knows what is being asked for so course. that when we talk about the differences, we know what it is of that's course. being asked well, that, for. That was... Uh, it uh, might have been assumed, but just calling that out would be okay. great. So thank that's you. Fine. I make that motion with Director Long's suggestion. As soon as as soon as possible. Yeah, I. I agree. Maybe after we get answers to the question one, two, and three, that timeline will become more certain. I don't think I'm going to have to say that. I'll, I'll second the motion. Yeah. <clears throat> Is the motion accepted? Did you have a question? No, as soon as the motion and second comes, then I'll ask. I'll make an observation. Do you have a motion in a second? second? There's a motion in a second. Great, thanks. I just want to add, clarify we are going to do number three as well, correct? Yes. What I what I asked for. That's in, that's included as part of the motion. Because I would say I would say to Ms. Klima, I absolutely agree. And that's what we do at the city of Camarillo. We have an annual work session where we direct staff, they come up with, with what we want from a policy standpoint. And they take that and they they provide a whole set of goals and objectives and action strategies to put that out for the next fiscal year. That's where I would like this board to go. But in order to get there, I got to know what this agency needs to accomplish in the next six months. And I don't have a good idea on that because we don't have the personnel ready to go. And so I'm taking that lead, Arnie, off of the December conversation where there was an entire list. I want to know who's going to be doing that stuff. Prioritization's critical, but we also have to get, we have to get this stuff done. We need a short-term plan to get things done. Thank you. motion in a second. We need a roll call. Chair West? Yes. Director Long? Yes. Director Mohart? Yes. Director Tremblay? Yes. Director Borcher? Yes. Right, thank you. Before moving on to number 11, why don't we take a 10-minute break and, and reconvene at 3.55. Thank you. I know. i got to go to city council. Okay. okay. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. i got to go run a city council meeting. I'm already late. Thank you. Nice to be here. Oh, you have to close. We have closed sessions at 4. Today, 4. Usually it's 4.30. Sorry about that. I just want to put my voice back.
Good afternoon, everyone. We are returned from our break. It is 3.57. We are returned from the break. I'm going to make a, a brief, cal a brief uh, agenda change. We're going to defer items 11 and 12 to a future agenda and proceed directly to item number 13. Who's doing, is that you? Item 13. So we're deferring item 11 and 12 till the next meeting. Correct. Did you hear that? <laughs> because that. Did I, did, did I not speak clearly? It's, I apologize. Is somebody going to present that, or do you want me to do it? <laughs> is, is Jeff Pratt coming today? I have not confirmed that he will be here. I have not heard confirmation from him. Okay. okay. So do we have an actual plaque? I think, I think the plaque follows the resolution or something, but... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a... Uh, item 13 is a, a proposed a res resolution thanking and recognizing... Uh, Jeff Pratt for his service to the agency, however controversial it may or may not have been, uh, can't obscure the fact that for over 20 years he helped guide the agency, you know, through its successes and failures both. And I think it's appropriate to to recognize that. And a resolution has been proposed. It's resolution uh, 202403. Um, nope, wrong resolution. Sorry, it's um, 20 resolution 202402. Um, uh, recognizing and honoring Jeff's service. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. And I would also like to state, just for those watching, um, we had a wonderful send-off for him yesterday. This room was packed with people at the Board of Supervisors, and we also had another event um, that everyone was invited to um, for the roast. So that might be the reason why he's not here today because he's probably partied out. But um, anyways, I just really appreciate his time and effort um, working for the good of the order. So thank you. Questions or comments from the public? Uh, Jurgen Gramco, Southland Sod Farm. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say I work with Jeff almost throughout his entire tenure. I mean, I've been coming to these board members for, what is it, Lynn, 40 years? As long as Close to it. And, you've been here. <clears throat> and um, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of negative comments about him here today. And, and I think the reason for that is that there's been, to say this as delicately as I can, the board had some political agendas in the past that Jeff got caught in the middle of. And those political agendas were not well received by the ag agricultural community. And, um, you know, Jeff was put in a position where he had to execute on some policies that weren't, that were not po popular. But, <clears throat> you know, beyond that, I um, always found him to be very reasonable if you could make a case based on a set of facts and a logical argument. You know, he was an engineer by education, and it, it, if, if you could 
use the facts and the logic, he could be persuaded. If you tried to snow him, it wasn't going to work. And, you know, one of the reasons I think people had some issues with him is that he, he draws some pretty bright lines. And, you know, those of us that were schooled in engineering, we live by the laws of physics. And they're not negotiable. They are what they are, and it's a line that you simply have to contend with. So, um, Jeff, from where I sit, did, did, did a great job with limited resources and political controversy, and I'm sorry to see him go. Thank you. All right, there's a motion and a second. We need a roll call. Chair West. Yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mohart. Yes. Director Trembley is not here. Director Borchard. Yes. The last item of business then is we need a motion to receive and file the executive officer's report. A motion. And a second. Second. And a roll call. Chair West. Yes. Director Long. Yes. Director Mulhart. Yes. Director Tremblay is absent. Director Borchard. Yes. Thank you. We're adjourned.